If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Additionally, if you would like to request novels and access my Google Drive where I have 200 plus audiobooks, then you can join my Patreon, link is also provided in the description. Chapter 21 A Bit of Everything That's wandless spell casting, Yvonne said, then gestured to Hermione, adding, although Hermione can't do it yet, she's already mastered a lot of magic. Really? Neville asked, sounding impressed. Ahem. The little witch raised her head proudly, then elegantly drew out her wand, ready to show off a little in front of Neville. After all, he was the first little wizard from a wizarding family they had met, and Hermione wanted him to evaluate whether her level was good enough. Reparo. Hermione noticed a tear in Neville's clothes and waved her wand, using the mending charm to fix the damage instantly. Oh. Thank you, thank you. Neville hurriedly thanked her and praised, Hermione, you're really good. Ah. Uh, I am all right, Hermione said, lowering her head shyly. She hadn't wanted to lose to the little wizards from wizarding families, not because she liked showing off. Hearing Neville's genuine praise suddenly made Hermione feel a little embarrassed. As the three of them chatted, the train had already left London. There was a sound of click, click in the aisle, and a smiling woman with dimples pushed open the compartment door and asked, Anything from the trolley, dears? Would you like to buy some food? I... I want a licorice wand, Neville said timidly. Neville fumbled in his pocket, trying to find the pocket money his grandmother had given him. Meanwhile, Hermione, sitting next to Yvonne, eyed the trolley eagerly, clearly curious about the food from the wizarding world. Hello, Yvonne called out, taking a few galleons from his pouch. We'll take a bit of everything. Yvonne. Hermione gasped, thinking he was being a bit extravagant. But Yvonne reassured her with a smile, saying he was eager to try all kinds of wizarding food and that they could always take whatever they didn't finish to Hogwarts. Nothing will go to waste, he said. Before long, their compartment was filled with an assortment of wizarding treats, Bertie Bott's every flavor beans, Drupal's best blowing gum, chocolate frogs, pumpkin pasties, cauldron cakes, licorice wands, and some other strange-looking foods they hadn't seen in Diagon Alley. Yvonne had spent 13 silver sickles and 4 bronze nuts, which wasn't much considering how much they got. Child, would you like anything else? The trolley lady asked. On the other side of the compartment, Neville was still struggling to find his money. Come on, eat with us. Yvonne offered, noticing Neville's predicament and inviting him to share their snacks. This also conveniently stopped Hermione from insisting on paying for her share. With Yvonne footing the bill for all three of them, even Hermione couldn't refuse. Thank you, Neville said gratefully, looking at Yvonne. I always forget things, my memory's really bad. Yvonne, however, knew the real reason behind Neville's memory issues. It was likely the result of a memory charm cast on him when he was a child. Despite this, Neville wasn't without talent he simply hadn't yet had his breakthrough. After all, Neville would go on to become the professor of herbology at Hogwarts, proving his natural aptitude for magical plants. Let's eat, Yvonne suggested. Both he and Hermione had only had a few slices of bread that morning and were already hungry. Each of them grabbed a snack. Yvonne opted for chocolate frogs, something he'd always found fascinating since watching the Harry Potter films. Hermione, on the other hand, chose a licorice wand, assuming it would be good since Neville, who came from a wizarding family, had seemed interested in it earlier. This is pretty interesting, Yvonne remarked as he opened his box of chocolate frogs. The enchanted candy immediately jumped out, trying to escape. But Yvonne was quick. He stretched out his finger and, with a subtle wandless spell, froze the chocolate frog in midair using the freezing charm, one of the ten wandless magics he had mastered. Wow! Neville gasped in awe, his round face full of amazement. His mouth hung open, and he didn't even notice the half-eaten pumpkin pasty slipping from his hands onto the table. Hey, snap out of it, Yvonne said, waving his hand in front of Neville's face to get his attention. Then, he tapped the floating chocolate frog with his finger and asked, So, how do you eat this? Just pop it into your mouth like this. Uh, ah, uh, yes, just eat it directly, Neville said, still a bit flustered. It feels a bit weird, Yvonne muttered. He didn't pay much attention to Neville's surprise. Instead, he played with the chocolate frog for a moment, contemplating the magic used to enchant it before finally putting it into his mouth. The chocolate frog, as if realizing its impending fate, squirmed as Yvonne bit into it. 
the sensation of the struggling chocolate made him frown. Yeah, it's better to bite off the head first, Neville suggested, speaking from experience as someone who had eaten countless chocolate frogs earning himself the title of chocolate frog killer. Ah uh, Hermione, nibbling on her licorice wand, frowned slightly. She understood Neville's intention, but the suggestion of biting off the frog's head still sounded a bit off-putting. Crunch, crunch, Yvonne accepted Neville's advice and quickly chewed the chocolate. As he bit into the frog, he noticed that the magic animating it seemed to dissipate, and with that, a rich, sweet flavor spread across his tongue. This is actually really good. I've never tasted chocolate like this before, Yvonne remarked. It was true, even across both of his lives, he had never experienced a flavor quite like it. The wizarding world certainly had its unique charms, and its food was no exception. The three of them continued to chat and laugh, sharing stories about both the wizarding and muggle worlds. Meow. The sound of the cat's meow drew their attention. Hermione turned to Yvonne and said, Yvonne, I think you forgot to let you am I out. Uh. Yvonne smacked his forehead in realization. He quickly used the levitation charm to bring down the cat carrier that had been placed up high. Meow, humph. Freed from the confines of the carrier, you am I, the ragdoll cat, meowed at Yvonne with a hint of displeasure. Yvonne quickly apologized, I'll give you some treats, you am I. Please forgive me. Yuamai grumbled for a bit before swinging her fluffy tail and making her way to the sofa to pick out some snacks that suited her taste. Yuamai, come here, Hermione called, waving her hand. Without hesitation, Yuamai grabbed a snack and leaped into Hermione's arms. After half a month of living together, Yuamai had grown quite fond of Hermione. In fact, the cat seemed to prefer Hermione's company over Ivan's. The little witch also let Crookshanks out of her carrier. Suddenly, the carriage was filled with two cats Yuamai, a delicate ragdoll cat, and Crookshanks, with her squashed persimmon-like face. Both cats were female. Crookshanks was a bit older and had taken to caring for the smaller Yuamai while they were staying at Hermione's house. Merlin's beard. Your pets. They are really adorable. Neville remarked, admiring the pair of cats. He couldn't help but think of his own pet, a toad named Trevor. However, when Neville turned to introduce Trevor, his face paled he suddenly realized his toad was missing. Chapter 22 Draco and Harry Trevor Neville's shout startled Hermione. What happened? She asked. My Trevor is missing. Neville exclaimed, looking anxious. Hermione, confused, asked, who's Trevor? Trevor is the toad I raised, Neville explained. Hermione felt a bit uneasy at the thought of someone keeping a toad as a pet but she didn't question it further. After all, wizards often had unusual pets, which fit perfectly with the muggle stereotype of witches and wizards. Don't worry, Hermione said reassuringly. Think carefully about when you last saw him. Hermione was always eager to help, and seeing Neville so distressed, she immediately began searching for Trevor. Neville was their new friend, and the sight of him on the verge of tears prompted Yvonne to join in the search as well. However, after a thorough search of the compartment, they still couldn't find any trace of Trevor. Yvonne, don't you know the summoning charm? Hermione suddenly remembered a spell that Yvonne had mastered. It was a spell that typically only older students could learn, and she had seen Yvonne use it a few times. But the kind of magic that could instantly summon an object seemed ideal for their current problem. Sorry, Hermione, Yvonne said apologetically, the summoning charm can't be used to summon living creatures. The summoning charm, also known as the Oxio charm, was only effective for summoning inanimate objects. Although in the movies, the summoning charm often shows objects flying towards the wizard, in reality, the summoning charm can make the summoned object appear directly in front of the caster. However, this spell has its limitations. The summoning charm cannot be used on large objects like buildings or most living creatures. While it's technically possible to summon a creature by summoning the container or carrier it's in, this can be dangerous. The speed at which the object moves is so fast that it could harm the creature inside. Yvonne realized that if he used this spell on Trevor, Neville's toad might survive, but he'd likely end up in bad shape. Through practice, Yvonne had also discovered why the spell had two names. If the object isn't in the caster's line of sight, it works as a summoning charm. If the object is visible, it behaves as a flying spell. The summoning charm cannot summon living creatures, but the flying spell doesn't have that restriction, as seen in Fantastic Beasts. However, this wasn't the right situation for either version of the spell. 
Is that so? Hermione asked, having never seen the advanced spellbook that contained the spell. Then what should we do? Trevor. Neville whimpered, looking even more lost and on the verge of tears. Yvonne didn't blame Neville. What more could you expect from an eleven-year-old child? Finally, when Neville's eyes started welling up with tears, Hermione couldn't stand it anymore. She decided to head out and ask other passengers if anyone had seen Neville's toad. Yvonne did not go, but stayed in the carriage to comfort Neville. However, he sent his own owl to accompany Hermione and her crookshanks. I remember that, Neville's toad will join us when we reach Hogwarts and McGonagall comes to open the gates. Yvonne shook his head, he felt that Neville's toad, Trevor, had its own way. As the saying goes, it's better to part ways amicably, so it's better not to interfere. Of course, if this is the plot of the movie, Trevor should return to Neville before the sorting ceremony. But if it were the plot of the book, then Trevor would return after the end of the semester near the Black Lake. Let's see which is it. Yvonne. Soon after, Hermione walked in excitedly from outside the carriage. As soon as the little witch sat down, she excitedly said, Do you know who I saw just now? It's Harry Potter. The boy who lived. Just like in the original book, Hermione met those two useless men. Yvonne actually had some feelings for Harry Potter. A child in his teens had the courage to fight against the killer, and face three-headed dogs, basilisks, dementors, fire dragons, dark wizards, and other terrible creatures, and finally defeated his fateful enemy. To be honest, if any other child were in Harry's position, who could say that he could be stronger and braver than Harry? At least Yvonne couldn't do it himself. So, Yvonne never looked down on Harry. This is a good child who is kind, simple, brave, and sentimental. From the perspective of making friends, Harry is definitely a good choice. The only problem is the conspiracy theory mentioned in the fan fiction Yvonne had read before, such as Harry being a pawn of Dumbledore and having been manipulated his entire life. Well, this needs to be paid attention to. Yvonne didn't want to get involved in Dumbledore's schemes. If possible, he wanted to pull Hermione out of the quagmire and turn the original story into the two useless friends. Want to go and see him. Hermione was like a little girl who wanted to share toys with her friends. She even forgot to help Neville find his toad. At this time, Yvonne glanced at Neville and found that he was completely immersed in the food. Poor Trevor. Yvonne mourned for Neville's toad, and then followed Hermione to the compartment where Harry was. Yvonne and Hermione walked down the aisle and soon came to the compartment where Harry was. However, there were three little wizards standing outside the compartment at this time. The leader was a pale blonde boy and the other two were sturdy, but they looked a little odd. Did this scene happen here? Yvonne immediately recognized the identities of the three people. The blonde boy was Draco Malfoy, and the boys standing next to him like bodyguards should be his right-hand men, Crab and Goyle. In the movie, the first meeting between the two was placed before the sorting ceremony. But in the novel, Harry had a life-changing first meeting with Malfoy on the train. Wait. Hermione wanted to step forward, but was pulled back by Yvonne. The little witch looked at him, puzzled, but heard Yvonne say, they seem to have something to say, let's not get involved. Okay. Hermione trusted Yvonne very much, and immediately leaned against the window obediently, giving up her position in the aisle to avoid causing trouble for others. At this moment, not only Yvonne and Hermione, but other little wizards also noticed the commotion and looked over. Is it true? Malfoy enjoyed the attention of the crowd, and he said with a hint of sarcasm, people on the whole train are talking about Harry Potter in this compartment. So it's you, right? Yes. Harry had seen too many people who came because of his reputation, and he was almost used to it. It's just that Malfoy gave Harry a bad impression. That arrogant and superior attitude made Harry think of one word pretentious. To be honest, Harry didn't want to interact with people like Malfoy. However, looking at the two big and strong boys standing next to Malfoy, Harry decisively chose to follow his instincts. Oh, this is Crab, and this is Goyle. Malfoy noticed that Harry was looking at them and introduced them casually, then said solemnly, As for me, my name is Malfoy, Draco Malfoy. Chapter 23 Bickering Pfft, cough. Ron coughed lightly to avoid laughing out loud. Draco Malfoy's face darkened. He looked at Ron and said, Dissatisfied, is my name funny? Draco means dragon in English. It's like taking names from novels and using them in the real world, which seems particularly cringeworthy. Especially with his last name Malfoy, 
meaning evil or bad faith, Ivan wondered how Draco's father dared to use something like Evil Dragon to name his child. Ivan really didn't know how big Lucius Malfoy's ego must be. Well, I don't know who to blame. Yet, JK's naming sense was terrible. No need to ask who you are. While Ivan was lost in thought, Malfoy had already started his verbal attack, my father told me that the Weasleys all have red hair, freckles all over their faces, and they have too many children to afford. You'll soon find that some wizarding families are much better than others, Potter. Malfoy turned to Harry and said, You don't want to make friends with the wrong sort, do you? Yvonne thought that old Lucius Malfoy was probably just jealous. Although the Weasleys are considered blood traitors, they are really fertile. One family, nearly ten wizards how can anyone compete with that? Maybe the Weasleys are poor, but their ability to have many children must make the pure blood families in the wizarding world envious. I can help you with this. Ignoring the bystanders around him, Malfoy reached out to Harry, but Harry didn't take his hand, I think I can tell who the wrong sort is myself, thanks. Draco Malfoy's pale cheeks didn't turn red, but there was a faint blush of anger of course. Watching this scene, Yvonne could roughly guess what Malfoy was thinking. This kid had probably come to make friends with Harry. But because he didn't know how to interact with others, he came across as aggressive. In Ivan's words, it was a classic case of Tsundera. He clearly wanted to make friends with Harry, but he had to act superior, as if befriending him was a favor. So, angry and embarrassed, Malfoy threw his father's advice out the window. If I were you, Potter, I'd be especially careful. Malfoy said slowly, you should be polite, or you'll end up like your parents. If you hang out with people like the Weasleys or Hagrid, you'll be dragged down with them. You. Harry and Ron stood up, and Ron's face was as red as his hair. Say that again. Ron couldn't stand being insulted like this, especially when it involved curses about his parents, family and bloodline. He clenched his fist tightly, wishing he could smash it into Malfoy's smug face. Oh, you want to fight, don't you? Malfoy sneered, he didn't care about the anger of the two at all. His father was one of the school governors of Hogwarts, and he was the heir of the Malfoy family. Even if it was the famous Harry Potter, so what? Others regarded him as the savior and were grateful to him, but the Malfoy family had sided with the Dark Lord. To be honest, Harry not only didn't bring any benefits to the Malfoy family, but also ruined their investment in Voldemort. At this time, Malfoy had no idea how terrifying Voldemort truly was, nor how desperate the Malfoy family would become. He only knew that the Death Eaters looked impressive, and his father, who had been one of the Dark Lord's closest followers, seemed even greater. Get out right now you're not welcome here. Though Harry was a little scared after all, he had never been in a fight in his life and had always been bullied since childhood he stood his ground. To be honest, Harry's heart was not as brave as it appeared, especially with Crab and Goyle standing next to Malfoy. These two were much bigger than him and Ron. Are you ordering me? Why? We're not afraid of the so-called savior. Malfoy was determined to teach Harry a lesson, and he noticed the snacks in the carriage, we've finished all the food but you seem to have some left here. As soon as he finished speaking, Goyle quickly reached out to grab the chocolate frog next to Ron. Seeing this, Hermione could no longer suppress her frustration and immediately prepared to step forward to defend Harry. Hermione saw the whole situation unfold, and it was clearly Malfoy who was at fault, picking a fight for no reason. Harry did nothing wrong, and neither did Ron. No one can stand being humiliated for no reason. Oh? Are you going to fight them? Yvonne asked Hermione curiously. The little witch looked back at him in surprise and said in disbelief, How can we fight? That's wrong. Well, Hermione is a good kid. She just wanted to stop the fight and remind them that fighting isn't the answer. However, before Hermione could act, Ron suddenly lunged forward from the carriage. Ah! The next moment, Goyle screamed. This confused Ron, who thought he hadn't even touched the guy. When they looked up, they saw a fat rat hanging from Goyle's finger it was Ron's pet rat, Scabbers. Scabbers' sharp little teeth were buried deep in Goyle's flesh. Goyle screamed and waved his hand frantically to shake off Scabbers. Crab and Malfoy backed away in fear at the sight. Peter Pettigrew. Ivan's eyes narrowed slightly, but he quickly composed himself, forget it, this has nothing to do with me. No need to cause trouble for now. However, just because Yvonne didn't intend to get involved didn't mean that others wouldn't notice him. Is something funny? 
Malfoy suddenly turned his head and glared at Hermione, who was standing next to Ivan. The little witch was startled and quickly realized that laughing secretly had been impolite. But the thing was, Malfoy and his two friends had provoked Harry first, and now they were scared by a rat. It surprised Hermione, who had higher expectations for these pure-blooded wizards. Sorry, we didn't mean to laugh at you. Ivan stepped forward and stood in front of Hermione. He glanced at Harry and Ron in the carriage and introduced himself, Nice to meet you, Mr. Harry Potter. I'm Ivan Ambrosius. Compared to Malfoy's arrogance, Harry's impression of Ivan was much better. Hello. Harry extended his hand and shook hands with Ivan, which made Malfoy visibly annoyed. Both had come to make friends, but Harry's attitude toward Ivan was completely different from how he had treated Malfoy. What annoyed Malfoy even more was that, despite still standing there, Ivan seemed to ignore him and continued talking to Harry. Comment. 18 Comment. Vote. Chapter 24, 24, Just Give Him a Beating. Enough. Malfoy glared at Ivan. Who are you? Ambrosius? I've never heard of such a wizarding family in England. How foolish can these people of the magical world be? Well, even Professor McGonagall, who is more older in this world, couldn't recognize the name without Ollivander's help. Yvonne ignored Malfoy and gestured for Hermione to walk into Harry's compartment. Harry, of course, didn't stop them. He could tell that Yvonne was being very friendly toward him. As for Hermione, the little witch had just helped him repair his old glasses, and Harry had a very good first impression of her. Nice seeing you again, Harry. Hermione held you Yumi and sat opposite Harry and Ron. Yumi seemed to have noticed something and stared at the rat, Scabbers, next to Ron. Hey. Watch your cat. Ron quickly shielded Scabbers, afraid that Yumi might pounce on his rat and eat it. Yumi. Yvonne knew Scabbers' true identity. Yumi's reaction was probably similar to Crookshanks in the original book, where the cat's instincts told her that Pettigrew wasn't a good thing. However, since Crookshanks had been left with Neville, this task now fell to Yumi. Meow. Yumi didn't quite know what was off about Scabbers, but she sensed something strange. Yumi silently warned her master that something was wrong with the rat and that he should be cautious. Don't worry about it, Yumi. Yvonne didn't understand cat language, but his meaning was clear enough, telling Yumi not to act rashly. Enough. Suddenly, Malfoy growled from outside the door, his face dark with anger. Being ignored by Yvonne and dismissed by Harry was a humiliation Malfoy had never experienced before. Is this your answer, Harry Potter? Malfoy said arrogantly. Weasley's poor trash, two moodbloods you are just like your stupid parents. Sooner or later, you'll end up just like them. Harry lunged forward, enraged by the personal attack, especially when it involved his parents. Malfoy was startled, but Crabbe and Goyle quickly moved to block Harry in time. Ron saw this and planned to help Harry, clutching Scabbers tightly. Disappointing. Yvonne could hardly bear to watch the scene any longer, so he casually waved his hand at Goyle and Crabbe. The next moment, the two were lifted into the air by an invisible force, and then, to Malfoy's horror, they flew backward and crashed outside the carriage, dragging Malfoy with them. Ah! Ow, ow, ow! Idiot! You're crushing me! Get up! The three of them were tangled together like a human pyramid, with Malfoy at the bottom. The combined weight of Goyle and Crab nearly crushed him. This! Harry and Ron looked at each other clearly not understanding what had just happened. You should learn to respect others. Yvonne looked at Malfoy with a stern expression and raised his hand. The three young wizards screamed as they floated back up into the air. And I don't want to hear that word you used ever again. Got it. Gulp. Ivan's tone was calm and gentle, but to Malfoy and the others, it sounded like a devil's whisper, making them tremble with fear. Thud. As Yvonne released the magic, the three fell from the air. However, due to their unstable footing, they stumbled and collapsed to the ground once again. Pa! Yvonne shook his head in disappointment, snapped his fingers, and the door of the carriage closed just before any older students could arrive. On the other side, Harry and Ron stood there, staring blankly at the carriage door as it automatically shut in front of them. With a loud bang, the two snapped out of their confusion, turning to look at the calm Yvonne with utter disbelief. How did you do that? Ron sat back down trembling slightly. I mean, what was that? Although he wasn't the target, Ron was truly frightened by Yvonne. 
he didn't even dare to look directly at Ivan now, sitting timidly in a corner, holding Scabbers tightly in his arms, fearing that Ivan might get upset and harm his rat. What kind of stupid question is that? Hermione covered her face subconsciously. She couldn't say she had a good impression of Ron she felt more disdain, like a top student facing a poor student. Of course it's magic. Wow. Harry looked at Yvonne with admiration and said sincerely, You're amazing. Can I call you Yvonne? Of course. Yvonne smiled and said, Just now I used a levitation charm and a banishing charm. They're not advanced spells you'll learn them in first year. As he said this, Yvonne casually demonstrated again, sorting out the snacks scattered on the floor and letting them float neatly between Harry and Ron. Brilliant. Ron's praise for Yvonne made Hermione quite happy. She added her own compliment unabashedly, Yvonne is the best young wizard I've ever seen. Yvonne, don't you need a wand to cast magic? Unlike Ron, Harry noticed something important. He realized that Yvonne hadn't taken out his wand the entire time, yet he still performed all those magical feats with just a wave of his hand. Oh yes. That's wandless spell casting. Ron exclaimed, you can cast a spell without a wand. What is that? Harry had just entered the wizarding world and didn't understand the significance of wandless spell casting. It wasn't until Hermione proudly explained the difficulty of mastering this magical skill to both of them that Harry realized how impressive it truly was. This led to Harry admiring Yvonne even more. Not burdened by fame, Yvonne nodded secretly, thinking, as expected of the protagonist of a fairy tale the princess is kind and beautiful, and the knight is just and loyal. Of course, Yvonne wasn't belittling Harry Potter. He was simply reflecting on Harry's excellent character. If anyone else suddenly went from being an orphan to a wealthy heir with billions, who could say they would handle it better than Harry? He had wealth and fame in abundance. But Harry didn't lose himself in any of that. Instead, he clearly recognized his own shortcomings. He was Harry just Harry. He wasn't powerful at all and didn't even know any magic yet. Instead of indulging in those grand illusions, Harry wanted to better himself and prove his worth. Well, it's not as difficult as Hermione makes it sound. Yvonne gently patted Hermione's head and straightened her slightly messy hair, causing the little witch to blush furiously. Like Hermione, I come from the muggle world. Yvonne shared his background with the two of them, while Hermione and Harry remained puzzled by Malfoy's earlier behavior. They asked Yvonne what was going on with Malfoy and why he acted so arrogantly. They are the Malfoys, Dad often talked about them, Ron said gloomily. They were the first to come back to our side after, after you know who disappeared. Chapter 25 Girlfriend They said they were under the imperious curse, but my dad didn't believe it at all, said Ron. He said that Malfoy's father didn't even bother to make excuses and easily sided with the dark forces. Hearing that the Malfoy family was connected to the Dark Lord, Harry's face showed disgust, and Hermione looked a bit scared. The little witch came from a society governed by law. In her opinion, the Malfoy family was like street bullies, always picking on ordinary people. She was afraid that the Malfoy family might cause trouble for them and didn't want Yvonne to be dragged into it either. It's okay, Yvonne said with a smile. Hogwarts is the safest place in all of England. There, the power of the Malfoy family is meaningless. As for Lucius Malfoy being a school governor, that meant nothing. Everyone in England knew that Hogwarts was Dumbledore's domain. Only someone like Malfoy, spoiled by his parents, would think he could do whatever he wanted at Hogwarts. Exactly. Ron added. Ivan's so strong, he beat Malfoy and his goons in just a few moves. They should be the ones afraid of him. Ivan's effortless handling of Malfoy and his friends made Ron like him even more. No fighting. Hermione interrupted firmly. We should follow Hogwarts rules, study hard, and go to the teachers when we have problems, instead of solving things in such a barbaric way. After that, Hermione looked at Ron with a wary expression, worried that Yvonne might be led astray by this rude barbarian. She had already decided to keep her distance from Ron. And to protect Yvonne, too. Hermione felt that it was her duty to shield Yvonne from bad influences. Malfoy's words, while cruel, weren't entirely wrong. As the saying goes, if you associate with red, you will be red, if you associate with black, you will be black. Hermione had already labeled Ron as stupid, a poor student, and reckless and was determined not to let Yvonne befriend someone like that. Ron and Harry were both taken aback by Hermione's words. One of them had lived in a cupboard under the stairs all his life, and the other had only received basic family education before turning eleven. 
how could they possibly understand Hermione's mindset? Is she your girlfriend? Ron asked, looking at Yvonne for help, and even Harry glanced at Yvonne with a pleading look. They just couldn't keep up with Hermione's way of thinking and didn't understand her idea of being a good student. What? Hermione jumped up, her face turning red as she glared at Ron fiercely. The train will arrive at Hogwarts in five minutes. Please leave your luggage on the train, and we will take you to the school. At this moment, the train began to announce its arrival at the station. Yvonne, we should head back. Hermione, who was still flustered from being called girlfriend, quickly grabbed Ivan's hand and prepared to leave. Before going, she reminded him, you should also change into your wizard robes quickly don't wait until we're getting off the train to rush. Yvonne gave Harry and Ron a helpless look before returning to his compartment with Hermione, leaving Harry and Ron staring at each other. I think they might be a couple. Ron munched on a candy, and Harry nodded. Yvonne really is amazing. Not only was he skilled in magic, but he also had a girlfriend. Although the two boys didn't fully understand what a girlfriend was, they knew it was cool to have one. And Yvonne is so unlucky. Ron said with frustration, that Miss Know-It-All with the big front teeth she looked at us just now like we were idiots. Harry actually wanted to point out that Hermione only treated Ron like an idiot and had been quite kind to him. But Ron was Harry's first friend, and he didn't want to risk damaging their friendship. Aren't you two done yet? At some point, Hermione had reappeared outside the carriage. She seemed to have overheard Ron calling her Miss Know-It-All and was now staring at him coldly. I forgot to ask are you both ready for the Hogwarts entrance test? It'll determine which house we get sorted into. Hearing this, not only Ron but even Harry's expression changed suddenly. Especially Ron, who had been frightened by his brothers before coming to Hogwarts. For a moment, Harry felt so nervous that his stomach churned, and he noticed that Ron's face had gone pale beneath his freckles. The two hurriedly stuffed the remaining candies into their pockets and started changing. What's wrong with them? Yvonne, who had already changed into his wizard robes, saw Hermione return and noticed the anxious looks on Harry and Ron's faces. He didn't understand what was going on. Nothing. Hermione hadn't intended to scare them, though even she was a little nervous herself. Yvonne, do you know what the entrance test is? This. Yvonne nodded with a smile. I've heard a bit about it. What is it? Is it hard? Hermione hadn't expected Yvonne to actually know. Where did you learn it? I looked through Hogwarts a history, but the details of the sorting ceremony were only briefly mentioned. Yvonne understood the vagueness surrounding the ceremony it was just the adult wizards having some fun. With your ability, Hermione, you should be thinking more about which house you want to be in, rather than worrying about passing. The two had discussed this before. Yvonne wasn't particularly concerned, while Hermione was torn between Greyfinder and Ravenclaw. What about you, Yvonne? I'm fine with either. Yvonne didn't want to interfere with the sorting ceremony, which only happens once in a lifetime. If this experience were influenced by scheming or manipulation, it would taint his journey at Hogwarts. Therefore, Ivan's mindset was relaxed he would let the sorting hat decide. Whatever the outcome, Yvonne was ready to accept it. My gran wants me to be in Greyfinder, said Neville, who had been quietly following behind the two like a shadow. But I just hope I pass the sorting ceremony. As long as I don't end up in Slytherin, I'll be fine. The train slowed down and finally came to a stop. The young wizards pushed and jostled as they rushed to the door and stepped out onto a small, dark platform. The cold night air made everyone shiver. Hermione subconsciously moved closer to Yvonne, as if being near him would make her feel warmer. First year students. First years, over here. Harry, come on, are you okay? Accompanied by a booming voice from the front, Yvonne and Hermione looked up. A towering, bearded man holding a large oil lamp stood before them. It was Rubius Hagrid, the keeper of keys and grounds at Hogwarts. Chapter 26 Lighting the Way Ahead Whoa, he's so tall. Hagrid suddenly emerging from the darkness startled many of the young wizards. Yvonne even noticed that Neville was softly sobbing. He shook his head helplessly and gently patted Neville's back, like an older brother comforting a younger sibling assuring him not to worry too much about the sorting ceremony. Next, the group split up, with the older students heading in the opposite direction to take the carriages to the Great Hall, leaving the first years gathered around, waiting for Hagrid's instructions. First year students. Watch your step. All right, come on, follow me. Hagrid's rough, 
booming voice carried through the station, ensuring that every young wizard could hear him clearly. Yvonne looked ahead at the path it was steep and narrow, flanked by dense forest on either side, and the road was almost pitch black. Hermione and Neville, standing on either side of him, huddled closer. They weren't the only ones all the young wizards seemed a little frightened. Ah! Suddenly, a young witch let out a scream. It turned out the muddy ground beneath her feet was too slippery. She had tripped and nearly fallen. Yvonne shook his head. He really couldn't bear to watch any longer. Lux and Via Primas it. Yvonne took out his wand and gently waved it toward the lantern in Hagrid's hand. The next moment, the light from Hagrid's lantern began to flicker, and small dots of light fell from it. On the previously dark, muddy path, golden footprints appeared, illuminating the road behind Hagrid. Wow! What is this? The footprints are glowing. Is it the big guy's magic? But soon, with explanations from Neville, Hermione, and others around Yvonne, the young wizards learned the origin of the magic. For a moment, all the first years looked at Yvonne with eyes full of wonder, envy, and amazement. Of course, there were also hints of jealousy and reluctance. Oh! Hagrid noticed what had happened. He looked at the lantern, now glowing like a small golden sun, and then at Yvonne with gratitude. Did you do this? What kind of magic is that? Hagrid had indeed noticed the problem with this path before. However, since only first-year students used it, and only once a year, there hadn't been a strong need to fix it. Additionally, making young wizards walk through the dark was meant to imitate the journey of the original four founders, allowing them to experience a bit of the discovery of Hogwarts. This spell is called Lux and Via Primazit, sir, Yvonne explained. It's a charm I created by combining the Lumos and the Protean charm. Create. Hagrid was stunned for a moment. You mean, you created a new spell? Not only Hagrid, but all the young wizards who heard that Yvonne could create spells showed expressions of disbelief. Incredible. Is he really a first-year wizard? The young wizards whispered among themselves, but Yvonne didn't mind. Meanwhile, Hermione beside him looked proud. Miss Know-It-All wanted to shout to everyone how amazing her Yvonne was. When it came to praising Yvonne, Hermione Granger was never one to back down. I heard that walking the path of the Founders is a ritual that contains ancient and powerful protective magic, Yvonne said as he walked with Hermione toward Hagrid. There weren't too many first years, so even though Yvonne didn't raise his voice, everyone could hear him clearly. Yes, you. Yvonne Ambrosius, Yvonne introduced himself, waving his wand again. The bright golden footprints dimmed slightly, but still illuminated the path enough for the young wizards to see where they were stepping, preventing any falls. Hagrid was amazed by the sight. I've never seen a young wizard with such spell-casting ability before even starting school, Hagrid exclaimed. But with the opening feast fast approaching, he couldn't afford to delay any longer. He simply thanked Yvonne and then called out to the group, Come on, follow my footsteps, and watch your step. The little episode in the forest didn't last long. The first years now only knew that this year, there was an extraordinary young wizard a magical genius among them. Turn this corner, and you'll see Hogwarts for the first time, Hagrid called back. Then, a loud chorus of O oh erupted from the crowd. Yvonne and Hermione held hands as they looked up, and at the end of the narrow path, a black lake suddenly stretched out before them. On the high hillside across the lake stood a towering castle, its spires and windows glowing under the starry sky. This dreamlike scene left a lasting impression on the new students. So beautiful, Hermione said excitedly, shaking Ivan's hand. Is this Hogwarts? I can't believe we'll be learning magic here. No more than four to a boat. Hagrid pointed to a group of small boats moored on the shore and shouted. Yvonne guided Hermione and Neville onto one of the boats, along with a girl with two golden braids. When he heard her name Hannah Abbott even Yvonne couldn't help but be a little awestruck. As they say, the story's protagonists may change with time, but Hannah Abbott remains constant. I remember that in the original book, Hannah eventually became Neville's wife, Yvonne thought. With this in mind, Yvonne glanced at Hannah and Neville standing side by side. Both of them were shy and introverted, which seemed like a good match. Are you all on board? Hagrid took a boat by himself and shouted to everyone, All right, let's go. The small boats immediately glided across the mirror-like surface of the lake silently moving forward. Everyone was quiet, mesmerized by the sight of the massive castle towering into the sky. As they neared the cliff where the castle stood, it loomed even larger, seeming to tower directly over their heads. 
Keep your heads down. Hagrid shouted as the first batch of boats neared the cliff. Everyone ducked, and the boats carried them through a curtain of ivy that covered the front of the cliff, revealing a hidden entrance. They followed a dark tunnel that appeared to lead to the base of the castle and finally arrived at what looked like an underground dock. The students then climbed out onto a shore covered with gravel and pebbles. Hey, look! Is this your toad? The students were getting off the boats one by one, and Hagrid stopped Neville while checking the empty boats. Yvonne turned around, curious as to how Hagrid had known the toad belonged to Neville. However, when Yvonne activated his psychic vision, he noticed a faint thread connecting Neville to the toad. Is it because of this, he wondered. Hagrid, though he didn't have psychic vision, likely had some special talent for sensing animals. Thank God. Neville stretched out his arms and shouted ecstatically. He never thought he'd be reunited with Trevor here of all places. Thank God, as a wizard? Really? Merlin's crying in a corner Yvonne thought, not sure whether to laugh or cry. He patted Neville on the shoulder. Hermione was also pleased that Neville had found his pet again. To be honest, both of them had nearly given up on Trevor. They had started to think the toad had abandoned its rather clueless little owner. Follow me, don't fall behind. After that, they climbed up a rocky tunnel, guided by the light from Hagrid's lantern and the glowing footprints left by the lighting the way forward spell, and finally emerged onto a flat, damp meadow beneath the shadow of the towering castle. Everyone climbed up a stone staircase and gathered in front of a massive oak door. Hagrid raised his enormous fist and knocked three times on the castle door. Here, Yvonne lifted the spell, and several of the younger wizards expressed their gratitude. Especially the young witches without Ivan's protection along the way, they would probably have had their robes covered in mud. Chapter 27 Ghosts The door opened, and a tall witch with black hair in an emerald green robe stood at the entrance. It was Professor McGonagall. McGonagall glanced at the first years, her eyes lingering on Yvonne and Hermione for a moment before finally settling on Harry Potter. The stern-looking Professor McGonagall was serious, but she felt a great deal of sympathy for Harry, given his tragic life. Seeing him finally arrive at Hogwarts gave her a sense of relief. First-year students, Professor McGonagall, Hagrid said. Thank you, Hagrid. McGonagall replied, I'll take them from here. With that, she opened the door wider. The entrance hall leading to the Great Hall was enormous, with blazing torches lining the stone walls. The ceiling was so high it was almost invisible. In front of them was a grand marble staircase leading to the upper floors. The young wizards followed Professor McGonagall along the stone floor. Yvonne could hear the buzz of hundreds of voices coming from the doors to the right. The students from the other years had already arrived. But Professor McGonagall led the first years to a small, empty chamber at the other end of the hall. Everyone crowded inside, rubbing shoulders with each other and nervously looking around. Welcome to Hogwarts, Professor McGonagall said. The start of term banquet is about to begin, but before you take your seats in the hall, you must first be sorted into your houses. Sorting is a very important ceremony because while you are here, your house will be like your family at Hogwarts. You will have classes with the other students in your house, sleep in your house dormitory, and spend your free time in your house common room. Professor McGonagall spoke, glancing at Yvonne subtly, and the perceptive boy noticed the look from the elderly witch, nodding slightly in acknowledgement. For an exceptional young wizard like Yvonne, no head of house would want to miss the chance to have him. As Ivan's potential guiding teacher, McGonagall hoped to secure him for Gryffindor. If another house managed to claim him, she'd probably want to toss the sorting hat into the furnace and turn it into ashes. The names of the four houses are, Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Slytherin. On the surface, of course, Professor McGonagall maintained a fair and impartial attitude. Each house has a proud history and has produced many outstanding witches and wizards. During your time at Hogwarts, your successes will earn points for your house, while any rule-breaking will result in point deductions. At the end of the year, the house with the most points will be awarded the House Cup, which is a great honor. Professor McGonagall played the role of head of house excellently, and her serious tone caused the young wizards to fall silent. I hope that, no matter which house you are placed in, you will bring honor to it. Now. In a few minutes, the sorting ceremony will take place in front of all the teachers and students of the school. McGonagall continued, I suggest you take a moment to tidy yourselves up and present yourselves well. Her gaze lingered briefly on Neville's slightly askew cloak and the dirt on Ron's nose. At that, all the young wizards began nervously fixing their clothes. Even Hermione whispered to Yvonne 
and Harry, in his nervousness, tried to flatten his unruly hair. I'll come back to get you when everything is ready, Professor McGonagall said. Please keep quiet while you wait. How do they figure out which house we go into? Harry asked Ron, who only had a vague idea himself. I think we have to pass a test. Fred said it would really hurt, but I think he was joking. A test? In front of the whole school? Ron's words caused a small stir among the first years, since most of them didn't know any magic yet. Hermione was in better shape she wasn't scared of the idea of a test, but she was worried about not getting a good score. For a moment, everyone seemed anxious. Yvonne could hear Hermione muttering to herself beside him, rapidly reciting the spells she had learned, uncertain which one might be tested. Ah! Suddenly, the young wizards screamed. More than twenty ghosts had suddenly floated through the wall behind them. These pearly white, translucent figures slid across the room, whispering to each other. Interesting. Yvonne ignored the ghosts' chatter, focusing more on their existence. He activated his psychic vision and examined the ghost closest to him carefully. In Ivan's eyes, the ghost was surrounded by a layer of magical energy, as if it were bound by some kind of power. So, Yvonne controlled his psychic vision and began to magnify the ghost's form by millions of times, observing it from a microscopic perspective. What's going on? Strangely enough, unlike the magical creatures Yvonne had observed in the microscopic world, the ghost had no physical substance. As Yvonne magnified it, the ghost's structure didn't become clearer. How to describe it? Normally, if you magnify something like a grain of sand, you'd expect to see smaller and smaller particles that make up the sand. But with ghosts, it was different. As Yvonne magnified the ghost, its form inexplicably disappeared from his vision once it became small enough. Yes, it vanished. It was as though the ghost was made up only of mist, enveloped in magic, without any smaller components. In other words, the ghosts in the wizarding world didn't seem to follow the physical laws of atoms and molecules. Is this the soul? Yvonne felt he had stumbled upon something fascinating. Souls don't belong to the material world, so the laws of the material world don't bind them. Move forward now, Professor McGonagall called as she returned. The sorting ceremony is about to begin. At that moment, the ghosts floated away, disappearing through the opposite wall. Chapter 28 The Great Hall and the Hat Now, line up in a single file, Professor McGonagall instructed the first-year students. Follow me. The young wizards at the front began to move forward, with Yvonne standing behind Hermione, and in front of her were Ron and Harry. The first years walked out of the room, through the entrance hall, and passed through a set of double doors into the magnificent Great Hall. Inside, students from the other years were already seated at four long tables, and thousands of floating candles illuminated the room from above. The four tables were set with gleaming golden plates and tall goblets, while another long table at the front of the hall was reserved for the teachers. Professor McGonagall led the first-year students to the front, asking them to line up facing the older students. The candlelight flickered, casting shadows over the hundreds of faces watching them like pale lanterns. Even the ghosts among the students glowed dimly with a silvery light. Everyone looked up, and above them, stars twinkled on the velvety black ceiling. This place has been enchanted to look like the sky outside. I read about it in Hogwarts, a history, Hermione whispered to Yvonne, leaning back slightly. Professor McGonagall gently placed a four-legged stool in front of the first years, then set a pointed wizard's hat on top of it. The hat was patched, worn, and incredibly dirty. Suddenly, the hat twisted and split open a wide seam, like a mouth, and began to sing. Oh you may not think I'm pretty. But don't judge on what you see. I'll eat myself if you can find. A smarter hat than me. You can keep your bowlers black. Your top hat's sleek and tall. For I'm the Hogwarts sorting hat. And I can cap them all. There's nothing hidden in your head. The sorting hat can't see. So try me on and I will tell you. Where you ought to be. You might belong in Greyfinder. Where dwell the brave at heart. Their daring, nerve, and chivalry. Set Gryffindors apart. You might belong in Hufflepuff. Where they are just and loyal. Those patient Hufflepuffs are true. And unafraid of toil. Or yet in wise old raven claw. If you've a ready mind. Where those of wit and learning. Will always find their kind. Or perhaps in Slytherin. You'll make your real friends. Those cunning folks use any means. To achieve their ends. When the hat finished its song, the entire hall erupted in applause. 
clap clap clap. The hat bowed to each of the four tables in turn, then became still. So the sorting ceremony is just about putting on a hat. Hermione said indignantly, clearly disappointed after all the preparation she'd done for the ceremony. This sparked discontent from Harry and Ron. Especially Ron, who was particularly annoyed with Hermione who, as clearly noticeable as a studious student, didn't seem to understand the worries of the rest. But how does it determine which house we belong to? Hermione asked curiously. Both Harry and Ron turned to Yvonne, the knowledgeable and calm one in their group. Yvonne explained, the hat is enchanted with powerful magic. The four founders of Hogwarts imbued it with their will so that it can sort students based on the qualities they valued. Imagine that the moment you put on the hat, the four founders are gathered around you, discussing where you should go. For those whose blood isn't pure enough, Slytherin would express disdain. Next would be Greyfinder and Ravenclaw, who value the courage and wisdom of the young wizard, respectively. And for those who don't fit the other houses, the kind and accepting Hufflepuff will always open its arms to them. Of course, this doesn't mean Hufflepuff is inferior to the other three. Yvonne believed that ambition, wisdom and courage are all positive traits that can guide wizards toward greatness. For children who want to grow, Hufflepuff won't stand in the way of their aspirations. But if you desire stability, are willing to work hard, and face life steadily, Hufflepuff will give you a warm home. Where did you learn all this, Yvonne? Hermione asked. I've never read anything like it in any of the books. The little witch didn't doubt Ivan's words at all. After spending half a month with him, Hermione had developed a hierarchy in her mind, Yvonne Professor Book Others. This is more like a talent, Yvonne replied with a smile. I can see the magic on the hat and hear the voices left behind by the four founders. Harry and Ron both widened their eyes, clearly not expecting Yvonne to possess such a skill. It's not that amazing. You can just think of it as me rambling. Tisk. Malfoy sneered disdainfully from the front of the line. He glanced back at the four of them with a look of jealousy. I've never heard of such an ability. You really love showing off, don't you, Yvonne Ambrosius? His pretentious and slightly sour tone fit the expression, the sky is clear, the rain has stopped, and Malfoy feels like he's superior again. Harry and Ron stared at Malfoy with dissatisfaction. Both of them had a high opinion of Yvonne. He was humble, knowledgeable, gentle, and steady, especially in Harry's eyes. Yvonne had stood up for him and dealt with Malfoy and his gang when they'd spoken rudely, and Harry wasn't going to let Malfoy insult someone who had been good to him. It's really ridiculous. Yvonne didn't care about Malfoy's sarcasm. He shrugged and said with a smile, then just treat it as one of my jokes. Don't worry about it. Unlike the arrogant, peacock-like Malfoy, the other young wizards clearly admired Yvonne more and were willing to believe in his words and his unique talent. Whoever's name I call now, put on the hat, sit on the stool, and wait for your sorting. At that moment, Professor McGonagall stepped forward a few paces, holding a roll of parchment in her hand, and called out, Hannah Abbott. Hannah's always strong. Yvonne muttered quietly. Even though she was at the back, Hannah was the first to be sorted. The nervous little witch walked out of the group, nearly stumbling as she stepped forward, and sat on the stool, placing the hat on her head under the watchful eyes of everyone. Hufflepuff. Yvonne whispered softly, only Hermione hearing him. Hufflepuff. The hat declared loudly. Sure enough, the people at the table to the right burst into applause and cheers for Hannah, welcoming her to join them at their table. Did you see that again? Hermione asked, saying something that Ron and Harry couldn't quite understand. Yvonne smiled helplessly. You know, Hermione, sometimes even I get a little overwhelmed by it. What about me? Did you see which house I'll be sorted into? If I told you, there'd be no surprise, right? Yvonne didn't answer, but just blinked at Hermione and the little witch rolled her eyes at him in anger. What are you talking about? Harry was puzzled, and Ronald was even more stupid, not knowing whether to watch the sorting ceremony or listen to Yvonne and Hermione's whispers. Susan Bones. Hufflepuff. Terry Boot. Ravenclaw. Justin Finch Fletchley. Hufflepuff. The sorting ceremony continued, and soon it was Hermione's turn. The little witch gave Yvonne a cute glare then quickly ran to the stool and put the hat on her head. Chapter 29 How do you have so much magic? Oh, a clever little girl, where should I sort you? The sorting hat had a certain ability in legilimency, allowing it to see some of Hermione's surface memories, not any personal secret, but more importantly, 
it could perceive her essential character, heart and will. Sometimes, the sorting hat doesn't simply make the best choice. It also gives people a chance a chance to change. Just like Neville, who was timid and cowardly, yet the sorting hat placed him in Greyfinder because it sensed that Neville didn't lack talent but rather confidence and courage. Similarly, Hermione was brilliant, but she lacked in other areas. For instance, Hermione didn't fully understand how to deal with people, didn't grasp the complexities of human nature, was overly focused on rules and regulations, held a superstitious belief in so-called truth, and lacked the courage to break the rules. And these qualities were precisely what Greyfinder nurtured. This is quite difficult, the Sorting Hat mused. For a whole minute, the Sorting Hat couldn't decide. If I put you in Ravenclaw, you'd surely thrive there. Ravenclaw. Hermione was well acquainted with all four houses due to Yvonne, but she didn't want to be placed in Hufflepuff. Though she didn't say it aloud, deep down, she subconsciously thought that Hufflepuff was where only less capable or lazy students ended up. As for Slytherin, Hermione instinctively rejected the idea of going to that dark and intimidating house. She felt out of place and inferior in front of the wizarding world's nobles who often hailed from there. Okay. I know where you should go, the sorting hat said with a slight tilt of its wide mouth before shouting loudly, Greyfinder. Pa pa pa. Professor McGonagall at the teacher's table beamed with joy when she saw Hermione sorted into Greyfinder. Hermione walked off the stage with a smile on her face. Though she didn't fully understand why the sorting hat placed her in Greyfinder, she was fine with either Greyfinder or Ravenclaw. Now, the little witch only hoped that Yvonne would be sorted into the same house as her. She didn't want to be separated from Yvonne. Next was Ron, who was sorted into Greyfinder just as in the original book. Then came Malfoy, Moon, Knot, Parkinson, and the Paddle Twins. Harry Potter When Harry's name was called, Yvonne noticed that all the professors at the teacher's table and the young wizards in the audience turned their attention to Harry. At that moment, Yvonne focused on the white-haired, white-bearded old man sitting at the center of the teacher's table. The most powerful living wizard in the entire Harry Potter world Albus Dumbledore. Just by sitting there, Yvonne could see the immense magical power radiating from the old man. Magic is not merely energy but a supernatural manifestation. The invisible aura around Dumbledore seemed ordinary at first glance, but in reality, it was seamlessly integrated with everything around him. Yvonne had never encountered such a feeling of returning to nature in any other wizard. Hmm. Dumbledore appeared to notice Ivan's gaze and looked back at him. The old and the young wizard locked eyes for a brief moment. Dumbledore recognized something in Yvonne. Just as Yvonne could sense Dumbledore's immense power, the old man could see the extraordinary potential in the boy. A naturally gifted wizard, Dumbledore thought. He smiled kindly. He was impressed by Ivan's talent but had no intention of doing anything more. Some people might believe that Dumbledore, always wary of the next Voldemort, would be cautious of any ambitious and gifted young wizard. However, Yvonne didn't share that view at the moment. His psychic vision not only allowed him to observe the magical world at a microscopic level but also gave him a sixth sense to detect others' feelings whether they bore him goodwill or malice. Dumbledore's kindness was genuine, pure, and free of any ulterior motives. He was simply observing an extraordinary young wizard with admiration. However, after a while, Dumbledore's expression became somewhat, perplexed. At first, Dumbledore showed a look of doubt, as if he were thinking, or perhaps recalling something. Finally, as if he had confirmed his suspicions, the old man's eyes became more solemn and filled with concern. Has he noticed? Yvonne wondered, secretly impressed by Dumbledore's perceptiveness. The old man had sensed the power silently lurking within him. Greyfinder. At that moment, both the old and young wizards were brought back to reality by the Sorting Hat's declaration. Dumbledore gave Yvonne an apologetic glance, then lifted his wine glass in a gesture toward Harry silently congratulating him on being sorted into Greyfinder. We have Potter. We have Potter. The Weasley twins shouted loudly, celebrating. Professor McGonagall was also smiling. She felt today was truly her lucky day. First Hermione, then Harry. Now, only Yvonne was left, and McGonagall was eagerly anticipating completing her trio of star students to help Greyfinder dominate Hogwarts. Yvonne Ambrosius. As McGonagall called Ivan's name, all eyes Hermione's, Ron's and the other first years turned to him. The older students didn't know much about Yvonne, and among the teachers, only Dumbledore and McGonagall were aware of his uniqueness. As a result, Yvonne didn't receive much attention. 
he walked forward calmly and sat on the stool. Professor McGonagall nervously placed the sorting hat on Ivan's head. It was amusing, in a way, that she, the one presiding over the sorting ceremony, would feel so anxious about the sorting of one particular student. Not Slytherin, not Slytherin, Professor McGonagall silently prayed. She really didn't want Yvonne to be sorted into Slytherin. It wasn't that McGonagall held prejudice against Slytherin, but the current atmosphere in the house was less than ideal. The older witch was worried that Yvonne might be led astray by their pure-blood ideology. However, McGonagall needn't have worried Yvonne wasn't a believer in the pure-blood doctrine. In fact, Yvonne agreed more with the phrase, for the greater good. Merlin's beard, what's going on with you? The sorting hat whispered in shock. It had existed for thousands of years, yet it had never encountered such a formidable young wizard, are you sure you are not some old wizard over a hundred years old who took polyjuice potion? The magic in Yvonne just from the sorting hat touching his head was like a vast, stormy ocean of power. Even more troubling was that another will seem to reside within Yvonne, blocking the sorting hat from reading him clearly. It could only catch vague fragments of his mind. When the hat attempted to delve deeper, that will turned into a black storm, frightening the sorting hat so much that it almost leapt off Ivan's head. Oh? I'm sorry, Mr. Hat, Yvonne said with a smile. I really am just a young wizard. All right, all right, the sorting hat muttered, calming itself. It had never encountered such a situation before. What a remarkable little one. You'll surely become a great wizard someday. Chapter 30 Greyfinder's New Lion King So. Yvonne didn't mind chatting with this magical hat. Out of all the magical items he'd encountered, only the sorting hat had creativity something that ordinary alchemical creations lacked. This showed how powerful the magic the four founders had infused into the creation of this hat truly was. How about Slytherin? The sorting hat didn't make a choice immediately but instead suggested tentatively, I can sense that your blood is exceptionally pure, even more so than the four who created me. If Salazar Slytherin were still alive and saw a wizard like Yvonne, he might have been willing to duel Greyfinder for him. Ambrosius's eternal bloodline was beyond extraordinary. Pure blood like Ivan's was already considered the pinnacle in the magical world. Sorry, Yvonne replied, although he saw all four houses as equal, some things weren't as simple as they sounded. I'm not particularly fond of the snakes from the Slytherin house. Perhaps you should reconsider, Mr. Hat. How about Ravenclaw? You are very intelligent, possess great wisdom, and have extraordinary talent, the sorting hat remarked. The two most suitable houses for you are Slytherin and Ravenclaw. Ravenclaw represented wisdom, and Ivan's deep love for magic would allow him to thrive in that academic environment. Ravenclaw. Yvonne had a good impression of Ravenclaw. If he were on his own, Yvonne thought joining the house of the studious eagles might be a solid choice. It seems this result still doesn't satisfy you. Sensing Ivan's hesitation, the sorting hat immediately understood his thoughts. In fact, the moment Hermione was sorted into Greyfinder, Yvonne had already made up his mind, simp. He didn't want to go to Slytherin it was filled with tension and toxicity, dominated by pure-blood supporters like Malfoy and his ilk. Some might argue that it would be advantageous for Yvonne to win over pure-blood nobles. However, Yvonne thought, a bunch of insects what qualifications do they have for me to win them over? I don't want to play house with those pompous brats, when the time comes, they would kneel. In the wizarding world, magic is power. For Slytherin, you don't need to play games of manipulation or exchange favors. As long as you are powerful enough, many will come to you on their own. Why should Yvonne bother with emotional connections when a group of people could be made to kneel with just the wave of a wand? Of course, this isn't to say there aren't any truly excellent students in Slytherin. Yvonne simply thought it wasn't worth spending time making friends with the students from the snakes the return on investment was just too low. It seems you've made your decision, said the sorting hat. Then, Greyfinder. As the sorting hat announced the result, Yvonne stood up, removed the hat gracefully, and handed it back to Professor McGonagall, who looked thrilled and teary-eyed. I won. I won. At that moment, the head of the house McGonagall wanted to say was, Slytherin, stay away from my student. Welcome to Greyfinder, young Yvonne, Professor McGonagall congratulated him softly. Yvonne smiled in return, then strode confidently towards the Greyfinder table. Greyfinder had just welcomed their new Lion King. Neville, who was sitting next to Hermione, was shocked and quickly gave up his seat for Yvonne. I was so scared just now. I thought you might be sorted into another house, Hermione admitted as soon as Yvonne sat down, 
finally expressing her earlier worries. Thankfully, they had both been sorted into the same house. Neville, Harry and Ron also warmly welcomed Ivan's arrival. Soon after, the sorting ceremony came to an end. Albus Dumbledore stood up. He looked at the students with a smile, stretching out his arms towards them. Nothing seemed to make him happier than seeing all the students gathered together. Welcome. Dumbledore said. Welcome to Hogwarts, where we begin a new school year. Before the banquet starts, I'd like to say just a few words, nitwit. Blubber. Oddment. Tweak. Thank you all. He sat back down, and the hall erupted into applause and cheers from the four long tables. As Dumbledore finished speaking, a wide variety of delicious dishes appeared on the long tables, including roast beef, roast chicken, pork chops, lamb chops, sausages, steaks, boiled potatoes, baked potatoes, fried potato chips, Yorkshire puddings, pea sprouts, carrots, gravy, ketchup. Having been in this time period for a while, Yvonne had grown accustomed to the 90s British cuisine. It must be admitted, however, that Hogwarts cuisine is packed with nutrients and protein everything a child needs in his slash her developing years. Just a little bland. Ahem asterisk. Oh. Yum. Fortunately, the food at Hogwarts was exceptionally delicious. Yvonne, Hermione and the other first-year wizards were already starving. With so many delicacies in front of them, no one could resist and eagerly devoured the food. After everyone had filled their stomachs, the remaining food disappeared from the plates, leaving them clean once again. A little while later, desserts arrived. There were all sorts of treats, ice cream, apple pie, treacle tarts, chocolate sponge cake, fried jam donuts, wine-soaked pudding, strawberries, jelly, rice pudding. As they enjoyed their desserts, the young wizards began talking about their families. Harry became the center of attention, as everyone was curious about his life in the muggle world. Unfortunately, Harry didn't want to talk about his miserable childhood. Soon, the conversation shifted to Yvonne. Hermione was busy asking Percy, a senior, for advice. She was eager to learn more about spells, particularly transfiguration, which she had been trying to study on her own but knew little about. Not just her even Yvonne hadn't fully delved into mastering transfiguration before starting school. Yvonne, how did you learn so much magic? Harry asked, looking at Yvonne with admiration. He wanted to learn from him and pick up a few spells himself. Harry didn't expect to be as skilled as Yvonne, if he could master even 20% or 30% of Ivan's abilities, he would be satisfied. Yvonne wasn't sure how to respond. He didn't want to discourage Harry, so he casually shared a few tips on wand casting with him. Halfway through the conversation, Harry suddenly put his hand to his forehead. He glanced toward the teacher's table, and Yvonne noticed that Snape was staring in their direction. But unlike Harry, Yvonne focused his attention on Professor Quirrell, who was sitting next to Snape. A cloud of grey mist. Yvonne saw a faint grey mist lingering behind Quirrell's head it was barely noticeable, but it was definitely there. That must be Voldemort's current state. Pathetic. He wasn't sure whether Dumbledore had noticed, but adhering to the principle of staying out of things that didn't concern him, Yvonne decided not to get involved in Dumbledore's savior training plan. Pushing those thoughts aside, Yvonne enjoyed the rest of his dessert. As the last of the pudding vanished, the feast officially came to an end. Dumbledore stood up, and the hall fell silent once again. Chapter 31 Hidden Achievements Oh, now that everyone has eaten and drunk their fill, I have a few more words to say to you all. Dumbledore's old voice echoed throughout the hall, as we begin the new term, I want to give you a few reminders. First, a note to the new students, no one is allowed to enter the Forbidden Forest on the school grounds. Some of our older students would do well to remember that as well. As he said this, Dumbledore's twinkling eyes briefly flickered towards the Weasley twins. In addition, Mr. Filch, the caretaker, has asked me to remind you that magic is not to be performed in the corridors during class breaks. The Quidditch tryouts will be held during the second week of term. Students interested in joining their house team should contact Madame Hooch. Finally, I must inform you all, Dumbledore's eyes grew serious, that the third floor corridor on the right hand side is out of bounds to everyone who does not wish to die a most painful death. Hearing this, the new students were left puzzled. Isn't Hogwarts supposed to be the safest place? Now, before we all head to bed, let's sing the school song together. When Yvonne heard the mention of the school song, he noticed that the smiles of the professors at the staff table suddenly stiffened. 
Dumbledore gave a casual flick of his wand, and a long golden ribbon flew out, snaking and twisting above the tables until it formed lines of text. Everyone choose your favorite tune. Dumbledore said, ready, sing. Hen all the teachers and students sang loudly. Hogwarts, Hogwarts, Hoggy Warty Hogwarts. Teach us something please. Whether we be old and bald. Or young with scabby knees. Our heads could do with filling. With some interesting stuff. For now they're bare and full of air. Dead flies and bits of fluff. So teach us things worth knowing. Bring back what we've forgot. Just do your best, we'll do the rest. And learn until our brains all rot. Everyone finished singing the school song in a rather scattered fashion, with only the Weasley twins continuing to sing along to the slow melody of the funeral march. Dumbledore conducted the final few bars for the two of them with his wand, and when they finished, his applause was the loudest. Ah, music, he said, wiping his eyes, is more magical than anything else we do here. It's time to go to bed. Everyone, head back to your dormitories. After Dumbledore finished speaking, he leaned over and said something to McGonagall. She looked puzzled but nodded in agreement. Ding! Hidden achievement unlocked, sorting feast. Sorting feast. Description, congratulations to the host for completing the once-in-a-lifetime sorting ceremony. The magical world is now officially open to you. Reward, 1 AP, Mysterious Wardrobe X1. A hidden achievement. The sudden system notification surprised Yvonne. It was the first time he realized that his system contained hidden achievements. And if there was a hidden achievement for the sorting feast, would there be others? For example, the first Christmas, first year graduation, and so on? Yvonne felt as though he had just gained an additional task at Hogwarts to explore the castle and uncover more hidden achievements. Another AP gained. The value of potential points was undeniable. With five points in his magic attribute, Yvonne was already on the path to becoming a naturally great wizard. As long as he continued to grow step by step, he could reach or even surpass Dumbledore's level without relying on external forces. However, Yvonne didn't add the points immediately. He needed to think carefully about how to use them. Additionally, Yvonne was very curious about the new system reward, the Mysterious Wardrobe. He had no idea what its purpose might be. Mysterious Wardrobe Description, a wardrobe connected to an unknown magical secret realm. Open it, and you can enter a mysterious magical kingdom slash realm. Status, ready to be collected, ask if you wish to collect it. Hmm. Yvonne. Hermione, walking alongside Yvonne as they followed Percy to the Greyfinder dormitory, looked at him in confusion. What's wrong? Oh, nothing, I just tripped, Yvonne replied casually before focusing again on the description of the mysterious wardrobe. A connection to an unknown magical secret realm. So it's essentially a door to a certain space. Yvonne realized that once the mysterious wardrobe was collected, it couldn't be stored away again it would exist in the physical world as a tangible object. Yvonne, Yvonne. Before Yvonne could think further, Professor McGonagall's voice called from the back of the group. Percy, I need to speak with Mr. Ambrosius here, Professor McGonagall said. Take the students to the dormitory. Okay, Professor. Percy nodded and led the younger students away. Yvonne gave Hermione a reassuring glance and then approached McGonagall. Professor, is something the matter? Come with me. Professor McGonagall motioned for Yvonne to follow. They walked through the castle, illuminated by the orange glow of burning candles, all the way to the headmaster's office on the seventh floor. Cockroach cluster. McGonagall recited the password, and the two ascended the spiral staircase. Throughout the journey, Yvonne remained silent, simply following McGonagall. Albus. They entered the headmaster's office, and McGonagall addressed Dumbledore. I've brought the student. Ah, thank you, Minerva. Dumbledore smiled kindly and gestured for Professor McGonagall to wait outside, as he wished to speak to Yvonne alone. Please make it quick, Albus. Professor McGonagall said, this child must be exhausted after a long day. I know, I know, Dumbledore responded quickly, assuring her it would only take a little time. All right then. McGonagall exited the headmaster's office and closed the door behind her. Now, only Yvonne and Dumbledore were left in the office. The portraits of past headmasters on the walls were curiously watching the young wizard who had been summoned by the headmaster on his first day at school. Professor Dumbledore. Yvonne politely asked the old man why he had called him, and Dumbledore smiled and nodded. 
what we're about to discuss may not be suitable for others to hear, wouldn't you agree? As he said this, Dumbledore raised his hand, and a silent magic enveloped the entire headmaster's office. The paintings, which had been expecting something interesting, fell silent, ensuring that the conversation between Dumbledore and Yvonne would not be overheard. You've asked me here because of what's inside me, haven't you? Yvonne didn't directly mention the Obscurus. Instead, he raised his hand, palm facing up, and a swirl of black mist poured out, quickly spreading throughout the office. A remarkable talent, Dumbledore remarked, his eyes filled with both surprise and concern. But child, do you know what this is? I didn't know at first, but I found something similar in a book I bought recently. Yvonne spoke plainly. It's an Obscurus, isn't it, Professor? Ah, yes. Obscurus. Dumbledore's expression shifted, recalling painful memories from his past. Others might not know Dumbledore's connection to Obscurials, but Yvonne was well aware. Dumbledore's sister Ariana and his nephew Aurelius, Credence, were both Obscurials. In a way, the Dumbledore family had been destroyed by the Obscurus. Chapter 32 A White Wizard or a Dark Lord The Obscurus is an extremely powerful magical force. It typically manifests in young wizards who have a lot but are forced to suppress their magic, Dumbledore explained. What surprised him most about Yvonne was that the boy hadn't been abused or mistreated something usually associated with the creation of an Obscurus. Your talent is exceedingly rare, Yvonne. Ivan's magical abilities were so immense that they might have been the cause of the Obscurus forming within him. For most young wizards, a magic outburst would lead to catastrophe, but Dumbledore had never heard of any such incident involving Yvonne over the years. This showed the extraordinary control Yvonne had over the Obscurus, and Dumbledore was impressed by the boy's ability to maintain a kind heart despite the overwhelming power within him. My nephew and sister, they were the same as you. After a long pause, Dumbledore revealed the most painful part of his past, something he had buried deep within himself. He hoped to dispel any doubts Yvonne might have and earn the boy's trust. So, I won't harm you absolutely not, Dumbledore said, his eyes sincere, as though he were seeing his sister and nephew in Yvonne. I believe you, Yvonne replied, though he didn't completely trust Dumbledore. The reason he wasn't particularly worried was that he had already glimpsed fragments of the future. It had to be said being an obscurial was like a nemesis for Dumbledore. The identity gave Yvonne the potential to overpower even the strongest wizard in the world without giving him a chance to fight back. Thank you, thank you for your trust, Yvonne. Dumbledore removed his glasses with trembling hands, perhaps seeing Ivan's response as a form of forgiveness from his long-lost sister and nephew. Professor, the book says that obscurials rarely live beyond the age of ten, Yvonne pointed out. But I'm already eleven. Some young wizards with exceptional talent may be able to defy that rule. Even so, Dumbledore's nephew, the longest living obscurial known, had still passed away at the age of twenty-five. You mean? Yvonne asked, there's no way to stop it. I'm sorry, child, Dumbledore sighed. I don't know how to. Since the statute of secrecy came into effect, obscurials had nearly vanished from the wizarding world, as most young wizards were enrolled in magical schools where they could safely learn and practice their magic. However, if you're willing, Yvonne, you can come to me, Dumbledore offered, saying that Yvonne could visit him at any time to ask questions about magic, and that he would do his best to help. Yes, Dumbledore intended to mentor Yvonne, helping him grow and improve his magical abilities. As for the Obscurus, Dumbledore admitted he could not provide a solution, but he believed in Ivan's potential. Thank you for your help, Professor, Yvonne said sincerely. With Dumbledore's guidance, Yvonne knew his magical abilities would surely improve by leaps and bounds. And Dumbledore was right. Instead of relying on others, Yvonne knew he had to believe in himself. In short, Dumbledore hoped that Yvonne wouldn't give up and would live with strength and courage. That's right, Dumbledore added, if possible, I hope you won't reveal this power easily. The Obscurial was like a ticking time bomb. Though it had become something of a legend, its deterrent power was far greater than that of werewolves. If the parents of other students were to learn of Ivan's identity, it could cause significant problems. However, just as Dumbledore had managed to protect Lupin by concealing his werewolf identity, allowing him to study at Hogwarts in peace, he was confident he could protect Yvonne in the same way. I understand, Professor, Yvonne replied, fully aware of the gravity of the situation. The existence of an obscurial was like a slap in the face to the magical communities of different countries. 
it exposed the failings of the Ministry of Magic in educating and guiding young wizards, which would likely lead to heavy criticism from the International Confederation of Wizards. Additionally, young wizards might see Yvonne as a monster, and the parents of other students would fear for the safety of their children. After all, the consequences of an obscurial's outbreak could be catastrophic. So Yvonne understood the pressure Dumbledore was under. I will try not to use this power. Just don't harm the other children, Dumbledore said gently. Dumbledore removed his glasses and reassured Yvonne that this wasn't a restriction. If Yvonne ever needed to use the power of the Obscurus, Dumbledore would protect him, even if his identity was exposed just as he had done for Lupin in the past. All right, Dumbledore said with a smile. Rest well. By the way, Professor. Yvonne was about to leave but suddenly remembered something. He turned around and said casually, I noticed something at the banquet. Oh? What was it? Dumbledore asked. The professor sitting at the teacher's table, Yvonne explained, the one with the cloth wrapped around his head. Professor Quirrell. What about him? I saw a black mist around him. Ivan's clairvoyance allowed him to see things that others couldn't. Dumbledore had likely sensed something as well, but he hadn't expected Yvonne to be so perceptive. Yvonne had mentioned this because of Dumbledore's earlier hint. Parents might worry about an obscurial, but what about Voldemort? After all, allowing Voldemort to enter Hogwarts and serve as the defense against the dark arts professor was no small matter. I'm aware, Dumbledore responded calmly. Dumbledore thought for a moment. I will handle this matter. Now you should go and rest, we don't want you to doze off tomorrow, do we? He said with a light chuckle. Ha, we don't. Well, good night, Professor. Since Dumbledore didn't want to elaborate, Yvonne naturally decided not to involve himself any further. He felt both cautious and trusting of Dumbledore. The caution stemmed from Dumbledore's cunning nature, one could easily become part of his grand plans without even realizing it. As for your trust, if you are talking about the original content, there's an old saying in the Harry Potter world, you can always trust Dumbledore. When you think about it, aside from the unclear circumstances surrounding Ariana, has Dumbledore ever intentionally harmed anyone in his life? It's important not to think too highly of Dumbledore, but equally important not to think too poorly of him. One thing is certain Dumbledore hadn't lied to Yvonne. That is, the old man would never harm him. But why wouldn't he? Ivan's first interaction with Dumbledore left him with a deeper impression of the White Wizard of the Magical World, for a greater purpose. Yvonne couldn't believe that Dumbledore was unaware of the issues surrounding Quirrell. Perhaps Dumbledore hadn't anticipated that Quirrell was possessed by Voldemort. But even if Quirrell had simply become a dark wizard, allowing him into Hogwarts was still a highly irresponsible decision. Then there were the so-called protective measures for the Philosopher's Stone those magical barriers that seemed more like a child's play than actual protection. Rather than true defense, it felt more like a trap to lure Voldemort in, and at the same time, a test for Harry. But no matter how you look at it, whether Dumbledore was baiting Voldemort or hiding something as dangerous as the Philosopher's Stone on the third floor, he was risking the lives of the young wizards at Hogwarts. Sigh this is Dumbledore. Yvonne couldn't fully understand Dumbledore's motives. But there was one thing he was certain of. Between the safety of Hogwarts students and teachers and his grand plan, Dumbledore had chosen the latter. The entirety of the Harry Potter series, all the original books, could be seen as the price paid for that moment. Every person involved, every crisis all of it. Harry is the savior, the center of the story. But what about everyone else? Sirius, Lupin, the Longbottoms, the Weasleys. These people chose to follow Dumbledore. How much risk did they take, and how much did they sacrifice? For the greater good, some people can be sacrificed even if that person is oneself. Thinking this, Yvonne couldn't help but smile, since I've come to this world. Wouldn't it be a pity if I didn't challenge the strongest wizard of the era? Is this dangerous? Yvonne thought it was rather fascinating. After all, Voldemort had killed so many people, yet Dumbledore hadn't taken direct action back then. It seemed that Dumbledore's attitude had always been somewhat contradictory. It wasn't necessarily the number of people who died that determined Dumbledore's stance it was whether or not Voldemort could lead the wizarding world into a new era that influenced him. If the Death Eaters hadn't grown increasingly reckless, and if Dumbledore hadn't realized that Voldemort was not the future of the wizarding world, would he have ever formed the Order of the Phoenix and led his followers to fight against him? Just like his solo duel with Grindelwald. Until the very last moment, Dumbledore had hesitated to turn against the person he loved. 
In other words, as long as Yvonne didn't cross Dumbledore's ultimate line, he never had to worry about the old man doing anything harmful to him. In short, let's set a small goal first, Yvonne thought, feeling the faint stir of ambition within him. Establish my own group within Hogwarts, and then... Become someone like Dumbledore. Uh, wait. Do I want that? What do I want? A white wizard I don't want to live my life for the sake of protecting others and then be blamed when I fail. A dark lord I don't want to antagonize the good people and cause destruction, but I want the servitude they have. I want to be powerful. I want to have fun. I don't want to serve and live for humanity. I want others to live for me. And I want to do whatever I want in my life. So not a white wizard, not a dark lord either. Let's meet in the middle. Let's become a white lord. Chapter 33 Adding Points Yvonne left the headmaster's office, and as soon as Professor McGonagall saw him coming out, she asked about his meeting. Yvonne didn't hide anything and told Professor McGonagall that Dumbledore had offered to let him come to him with any questions about magic. This surprised her, but she was also delighted for Yvonne. When it came to magical expertise, if Dumbledore claimed to be second, no one would dare claim first. With the guidance of such a renowned teacher, Ivan's path to growth would certainly be smoother. Professor McGonagall led Yvonne to the Gryffindor common room. She recited the password for the day and asked the fat lady to open the door for the two of them. It had been nearly an hour since the feast, and most of the young wizards had settled down. The initial excitement had faded, and the fatigue of the journey had begun to take over. Many students were on the verge of falling asleep, but Hermione, ever diligent, was still waiting for Yvonne in the common room. Yvonne. Hermione jumped up from the soft sofa. Why did you come back so late? Professor McGonagall. The young witch noticed McGonagall beside Yvonne and greeted her quickly. Dumbledore wanted to see young Yvonne. I took him to the headmaster's office, Professor McGonagall explained. The professor didn't stay long. She gave the two a gentle look signaling that they shouldn't stay up chatting for too long and should head to bed soon, then she went off to her own quarters. At Hogwarts, most professors had private rest areas attached to their offices. Only the heads of the four houses live in their respective houses to handle various emergencies. Yvonne. Don't worry, Yvonne reassured her. Headmaster Dumbledore discovered my talent and thought I showed promise, so he plans to give me some special guidance. Yvonne had no intention of hiding his status as an obscurial from Hermione. The little witch was his best friend. Just as Lupin had confided in James, Sirius and the others about his werewolf condition, Yvonne was willing to trust Hermione. He knew Hermione wouldn't distance herself because of the obscurus. On the contrary, with her deep sense of empathy, she would likely be more proactive than Yvonne in trying to break the curse of the obscurus. There are classes tomorrow. Yvonne gently patted Hermione's head. Good night, Hermione. Good night. They parted ways in the common room. Before leaving, Hermione pointed out Ivan's dormitory. Yvonne had always been curious about how many students Hogwarts actually had. During the dinner, he made a mental estimate and realized that the total number of students seemed to be fewer than 300, with about 70 to 80 students in each house. In Ivan's year, Gryffindor had 11 new students, 5 girls and 6 boys. The Gryffindor dormitory was a five-person room. When Yvonne walked in, he saw five four-poster beds with crimson velvet curtains hanging around them. The students' trunks had already been delivered, and Yuamai, who was locked in her cage, meowed excitedly when she saw Yvonne. Yvonne. Due to the number of students, Yvonne only had one roommate Neville. Is it just the two of us? Yvonne took Yuamai out of the cage and placed her on the bed, asking while he changed into his pajamas. Why yes, just the two of us, Neville replied clearly happy to have Yvonne as his roommate. That's great. Yvonne smiled. He checked the time, and after talking with Neville, they decided to turn off the lights and go to bed. It was midnight. In the dim dormitory, Yvonne quietly climbed out of bed after confirming that Neville was fast asleep. The reward for the sorting ceremony the wardrobe, Yvonne murmured to himself. He opened the system and saw a new option under the attribute list labeled props. Yvonne Ambrosius. H. 11. Gender, male. Race, wizard. Bloodline, Ambrosius family. Talents, Transfiguration Magus, Prophecy Magus, Seer, Silent Casting. Attributes, 1 Ordinary, 2 Excellent, 3 Outstanding, 4 Rare, 5 Legendary, 
6 Apocalypse, 7 Miracle. Soul, 4, Rare. Magic, 5, Legendary. Physique, 1, Ordinary. Thinking, 3, Outstanding. Mind, 2, Excellent. Will, 2, Excellent. Current Potential Points, CPP slash AP1. Holding Props, Mysterious Wardrobe X1. Mysterious Wardrobe. Description, A Wardrobe Connected to an Unknown Magical Secret Realm. Open it, and you can enter a mysterious magical kingdom. Status, Ready to be collected, Ask if you want to collect it. Equals 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 equals. Retrieve the wardrobe. As Yvonne thought this, an exquisite double door wardrobe materialized in front of him. The wardrobe was about as tall as a person and made of precious mahogany. Three full length mirrors adorned the cabinet doors, reflecting the moonlit bedroom and Yvonne standing before it. A mysterious magical kingdom. Yvonne murmured, running his hand over the cabinet door. Upon summoning the wardrobe, the relevant information about it appeared in his mind. The mysterious wardrobe was a system prop, bound to Yvonne. What stood before him was merely a projection of the real wardrobe. This also meant Yvonne could retract the wardrobe whenever he wanted. The only limitation was the time interval between summons after each summoning, Yvonne would need to wait 24 hours before he could summon it again. However, there was no restriction on retracting the wardrobe. Even if Yvonne were standing outside the castle, he could still dismiss the wardrobe's projection and make it disappear. By the way, I remember the sorting ceremony gave me one potential point Yvonne thought. He reopened the system interface, reviewing his current attributes. After careful consideration, he decided to stick with his principle, it's better to specialize in one thing than to be average in everything. System, increase soul attribute. Attributes. Soul, 4-5, Legendary. Magic, 5. Physique, 1. Thinking, 3. Mind, 2. Will, 2. Current potential points, 0. That's it. Yvonne tried to sense the changes in himself after using the potential point to improve his soul attribute. Unfortunately, he didn't feel any immediate benefits from the soul upgrade. He didn't feel any clearer in his thoughts or quicker in his mental processes, which left Yvonne somewhat puzzled. When the soul was upgraded to level 4, I unlocked psychic vision, which allows me to see the microscopic magical world, Yvonne mused. He closed his eyes, and when he opened them again, everything around him seemed to change. The wardrobe in front of him was glowing with a strange light a sign of magic. As he looked around, Yvonne noticed that everything in his field of vision had its own distinct color and set of magical rules. What is this? Yvonne wondered, struggling to understand the new ability he had gained after his soul attribute reached level 5. Magic vision, perhaps? Meow. Uemai, startled by the sudden appearance of the wardrobe, squatted at Ivan's feet and softly meowed, bringing him out of his thoughts. Forget it. I'll have plenty of time to explore the mysteries of the soul later, Yvonne said to himself. For now, want to go on an adventure, you am I. Yvonne took out his wand, glanced at Neville who was still fast asleep and cast a levitation charm to move the wardrobe into place. Having Neville as a roommate had its perks. He was quiet and introverted, completely unlike those mischievous kids who like to mess with other people's belongings. Neville was, without a doubt, a good boy. Chapter 34 Magical Secret Realm But before that, we need to prepare. Sanus Somnus Yvonne cast a new spell on Neville that he had developed from the stupefy charm. The magic of sound sleep could improve the quality of sleep and even set a precise wake-up time, ensuring Neville wouldn't miss breakfast the next morning while having pleasant dreams. All right, now everything's foolproof. Yvonne picked up Yumi and turned the mechanism on the wardrobe handle. With a crisp click, the wardrobe once meant to store clothes transformed into a door leading to a magical secret realm. The moment he stepped inside, a system prompt echoed in Ivan's mind. Side quest unlocked, magical secret realm. Task summary, through the wardrobe, you have entered a magical secret realm created by magic. Explore and uncover the mystery behind the creation of this realm. Task reward, unknown. Meow. Accompanied by UMI's soft meow, Yvonne opened his eyes. He recalled the side quest he had just received and looked at the world beyond the wardrobe. Before him lay a dense forest, with thick shrubs and towering ancient trees obstructing his view. Yvonne instinctively activated the magic sight he had recently acquired, the ability to see magical auras. 
instantly, the entire forest transformed into a sea of vibrant colors. The sky above, the soil beneath his feet, and every blade of grass and tree carried strong magical fluctuations. The sight was so overwhelming that Yvonne had to close his magical sight and observe the secret realm through normal vision. This side quest requires me to solve the mystery of this secret realm's origin. Yvonne pushed aside the bushes in front of him, feeling the soil beneath his feet and touching the nearby trees. Everything feels real there's no trace of transformation. This is genuine. You and I hopped to the ground, curiously inspecting the surroundings. Yvonne had brought the kitten along for two reasons, one, for the adventure, and two, as a shield in case of danger. You am I? Of course, that was a joke. Yvonne had already performed divination before stepping into the wardrobe, and the results showed that both he and Yumi would be back in class safe and sound in a few days. It was like reading his own fortune before embarking on any venture. Yvonne would never recklessly charge into an unknown world without preparation. Swish. As Yvonne was thinking, a sudden rustling sound made him tense up. Almost instinctively, he slipped his wand from his sleeve into his hand and pointed it at the figure that leaped out from the bushes. Hey! In front of Yvonne stood a strange-looking blue bird with a thick, short, curved beak it resembled a turkey brought back to life. A dodo! Yvonne recognized the bird. It was an extinct species he had learned about in nature class during his previous life. A. Hey. At the same time, the dodo seemed equally startled by Yvonne and Yumi. Pa. In the next instant, there was a sharp sound, and the dodo vanished in a flash of white light. What? Yvonne was momentarily confused, but quickly pieced it together. That wasn't a dodo at all it was a magical creature known as a Dirikal. According to Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, the Dirikal is a bird native to Mauritius, also referred to as the dodo by Muggles. Muggles were unaware of the Dirikal's ability to teleport, which led them to mistakenly believe the bird had gone extinct. Let's see where we are. Yvonne wasn't frightened by the sudden appearance of the Dirikal. He swiftly picked up Yuamai and began running in the direction of the bird's magical trace. Before leaving, Yvonne glanced back and noticed an ancient door marking the connection between the wardrobe and the secret realm the exit from the realm. Swish. Yvonne cast a marking spell on the door before proceeding confidently. Hwala hwala la. The bushes were constantly being pushed aside as Yvonne moved through them, his wand held tightly ready to respond to any potential danger. In addition, Yvonne reminded himself that he still possessed the power of being an obscurus. The terrifying ability, tied to having a magic power of five, was essentially a form of high-level dark magic. With such power at his disposal, Yvonne wasn't too concerned about encountering any serious danger. Moreover, even if he found himself in a situation where he couldn't win, Yvonne could always turn into black mist and escape. A. -A. G. A. G. A. As Yvonne made his way through the dense foliage, more Dirikal's ball birds leapt out of the bushes, making him wonder if he had wandered into their territory. Soon, the scenery ahead began to open up. Yvonne stopped, gazing out at a golden beach and a lake. The clarity of the world around him was striking, and it felt as though even his soul was being purified. He looked down and saw the same Dirikals he had encountered earlier, along with many other rare and exotic creatures he didn't recognize. They were gathered by the water, either drinking or playing, creating a stunning picture of ancient ecology. This secret realm is much larger than I thought, Yvonne remarked. Looking into the distance, he saw an unbroken chain of mountains stretching far into the horizon, seemingly without end. Yvonne also noticed birds and other winged creatures soaring through the sky, demonstrating the reality of the vast expanse within this secret realm. It was hard to imagine what kind of magic could create such a world. Is this truly part of the magic of Harry Potter's world? What can it actually achieve? Yvonne wondered. In his understanding, the upper limit of a wizard's power reached, at best, the level of Dumbledore and Grindelwald. Pushing further back, Merlin was considered the ultimate peak. But could Merlin have cast magic on this scale? To create a space where so many magical creatures could thrive, complete with a stable food chain and ecosystem, seemed far beyond anything Yvonne thought possible. It was much more complex than Newt's commander's enchanted suitcase. No, I can't think that way, Yvonne realized, recognizing a flaw in his reasoning. Ever since he had crossed into this world, it had become a real, living world for him. And in a real world, the history of wizards must be far more extensive than what is commonly known in the books. Consider, for instance, the question of who the oldest wizard in history is or where they came from. According to the historical records Yvonne had read, 
European magic was said to have originated in ancient Egypt. By that logic, the history of wizards spanned at least 3,000 years, if not longer. According to the Harry Potter worldview, Mughal mythology is essentially based on the history of wizards. For example, the gods of ancient Greece and Egypt, the Norse gods, the three sovereigns and five emperors of the East, as well as Jesus Christ could all be considered wizards in this world. Of course, different cultures and languages might refer to them by various names, but essentially, the powers these individuals possessed were still the same magic that Yvonne now understood, capable of altering the very rules of the world. Chapter 35 A Huge Thunderbird Hmm. Suddenly, Ivan's gaze fell on the distant lake. He felt a brief trance, and then scenes reflected by the lake's shimmering surface came into focus. At the edge of the golden beach, near the entrance to the woods, a golden giant beast descended from the sky amidst thunder, its target being the young wizard holding a cat. The scene shifted, and Yvonne saw the wind howling across the sky, magical creatures by the lake fleeing in all directions. On the ruined remains of the forest, a battered and furious giant beast stood roaring. Thunderbird The golden creature resembled the Thunderbird from the Fantastic Beasts films, though it was much larger than the one in Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. Oh! Yvonne jolted out of the vision, realizing he had just experienced a special prophetic state connected to the Thunderbird. Fuck run! Without hesitation, he grabbed Yuamai and sprinted toward the direction of the wardrobe. Boom! Thunder echoed overhead, and the previously clear sky was quickly covered by dark clouds. Just as his vision had foretold, Yvonne could hear the cry of a thunderbird amidst the storm. No. The speed difference is too great. If this keeps up, I'll be caught before I can leave the secret realm. Yvonne frowned slightly, sensing that the thunderbird was getting closer and closer. Bang! He abruptly stopped and tightened his grip on his wand. Faint red lines, like flames, began to spread across the wand, and the shadow of a sleeping phoenix emerged, as if it had sensed the enemy and was ready to fight alongside its master. It seems we'll have to fight, Yvonne muttered. He wasn't afraid of combat. While he hadn't mastered many spells, wizard duels didn't have to be overly complicated for him. Turning around, Yvonne aimed his wand at the figure descending from the sky. Swish! Without chanting any incantation, Yvonne channeled his magic and fired a red-gold magic projectile from the tip of his wand, aiming directly at the approaching beast. Chi! The thunderbird, illuminated dramatically by flashes of lightning, appeared majestic and fierce. Yet even such a powerful magical creature sensed the imminent threat of death as the magic bullet flew toward it. With a sudden stop in mid-air, the thunderbird managed to dodge the incoming attack. Bang! A deafening explosion echoed in the distance, and the shockwave swept across the landscape. The magic bullet had struck a distant cliff, blowing away half the mountain in a massive blast. The sheer destructive power was so overwhelming that even the mighty Thunderbird, the ruler of this magical secret realm, was momentarily stunned. Meow, WTF! Yuamai, the ragdoll cat, widened her eyes, seemingly stunned by her master's incredible display of power. Yvonne didn't send Yuamai away for safety. He held his wand firmly in his hand with the phoenix shadow aiding him in controlling the magic coursing through his body. With this control, he no longer had to worry about losing control of his magic. Gala Law Seeing the giant beast momentarily stunned, Yvonne didn't pause his attack. Black mist began pouring out from Ivan's body, and the earth, soil and surrounding vegetation turned to black ash, as though they had been incinerated. In an instant, a massive tornado with a radius of tens of meters formed around him. Roar with a wave of his wand, Yvonne directed the black storm to transform into writhing dragons, roaring as they surged toward the thunderbird in the sky, intent on strangling it. For a moment, the forest near the entrance was swept by the destructive force of Ivan's magic, creating a devastating wave of power that spread in all directions. Chi. However, the thunderbird's powerful lightning managed to block the terrifying offensive. The raw power of the black storm was indeed overwhelming, but the thunderbird's natural magic resistance wasn't weak either. After its storm and lightning weakened Ivan's assault, it was enough to resist the encroaching black mist. Fuck off! Yvonne roared, his voice echoing as the battle between the two forces reached a stalemate. Fush! The black mist and thunder continued to clash, and amidst the dim, stormy world, a red and golden light sliced through the sky. The phoenix soared upward, its wings merging with the boundless black mist, eventually forming a colossal black bird, dozens of meters tall, ablaze with black flames. Roar! 
seeing the black flame phoenix charging toward it, the Thunderbird felt a deep chill of fear, instinctively wanting to flee. Chi. But this giant Thunderbird had ruled over the forest and lake for years, and its pride wouldn't allow it to retreat without a fight. Without further hesitation, the Thunderbird let out a series of sharp cries and lunged directly at the Black Flame Phoenix. Bang! The Black Flames and Golden Thunder collided mid-air, and the resulting dazzling white light was so intense that Yvonne and Uamai were forced to shut their eyes. Yvonne could feel the immense pressure coming from the enormous Thunderbird. Far from panicking, he felt a surge of exhilaration. Who? With a firm press of his wand, Yvonne pointed its tip downward. Chi? Gradually, with Ivan's seemingly limitless magical power, the Black Flame Phoenix began to overpower the Golden Thunderbird, forcing it down toward the vast surface of the lake, all while the Great Bird let out agonized cries. Boom! In the next moment, a deafening explosion erupted from the surface of the lake, sending massive waves crashing everywhere. Ha! Yvonne, his mind still racing from the intense battle, finally exhaled as he temporarily repelled the Thunderbird. The magical power of that Thunderbird is immense. Let's not linger here anymore. Without paying further attention to the dramatic changes in the secret realm, Yvonne picked up Uamai and dashed toward the exit. Through his magical sense, Yvonne could tell that the Thunderbird wasn't dead. However, he was certain the creature wouldn't be feeling good after taking such a direct hit. Moreover, Yvonne sensed numerous powerful magical auras in the air, converging from all directions due to the recent battle. It was clear that the Golden Thunderbird wasn't the only powerful magical creature residing in this secret realm. Bang! A few minutes later, as the wardrobe door closed again, Yvonne and Uamai collapsed to the ground, leaning against the wardrobe. Ha! Huff! Ha! This magical secret realm feels incredibly dangerous. Yvonne tried to steady his breathing, still shaken. That Thunderbird, a magical creature of that magnitude are there really so many of them? In the movie, Newt's Thunderbird was only about four meters tall at most. But compared to the one Yvonne had just encountered, it was like comparing a baby to an adult. Yvonne couldn't imagine how disastrous it would be if he were entangled by several creatures of that magnitude. It's important to remember that the flesh and hide of magical creatures are naturally highly resistant to magic, making them immune to most spells. Otherwise, how could the Obscurus unleashed by Yvonne have been so easily blocked by the Thunderbird? It seems that until I possess enough power, I can't venture into that magical secret realm at will. With that thought, Yvonne stowed away the wardrobe. He then used a cleaning spell to remove the dirt and stains from his clothes before finally lying down on the bed. After a long day of travel, staying up until midnight, and briefly exploring the secret realm, Yvonne was feeling quite exhausted. Chapter 36 Hogwarts Library and the Mind Attribute The next day, Yvonne woke up from his sleep and checked the time it was 8 o'clock in the morning. The class schedule for junior wizards at Hogwarts was from Monday to Friday, with lessons from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. in the morning and 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon. After freshening up, Yvonne took out his schedule while feeding Yumi. Hermione had given him the schedule the previous night. The little witch was very diligent in her studies and was likely excited about the new knowledge she was about to gain. No classes on Monday morning. There's herbology in the afternoon and history of magic in the evening. Seeing that Neville was still fast asleep, Yvonne decided not to wake him and quietly left the dormitory. Good morning. In the common room, Yvonne encountered many seniors he hadn't met before, including the Weasley twins and Percy, who had just become a prefect that year. Yvonne. Hermione, sitting on a sofa with a thick book about wizarding society, quickly stood up and greeted him when she saw him coming. Good morning, Hermione. Yvonne noticed Hermione eyeing Uamai in his arms so he smiled and exchanged pleasantries with her. A General History of Modern Wizards Yvonne raised an eyebrow as he read the title of the book Hermione had been reading. Knowing her studious nature, he couldn't help but ask, you don't have to memorize all of that, do you? Of course. Hermione stroked Uamai and said matter-of-factly, we're living in the wizarding world now. We need to understand the culture and customs here, otherwise, what if we embarrass ourselves? But memorizing it, Ivan's mouth twitched slightly. All right, as long as you enjoy it. Yvonne, you should memorize it too. Realizing where the conversation was heading, Yvonne quickly changed the subject. Have you had breakfast yet? No, Hermione replied, looking slightly surprised by the sudden change of topic. Let's go. Not wanting to hear anything else that might shock him, 
Yvonne took Hermione's hand and headed toward the Great Hall. Along the way, they encountered one of the mischievous moving staircases. Thankfully, the Weasley twins were around to help, and the two of them reached the hall easily, enjoying a hearty breakfast. There are no classes this morning. What are you planning to do? I want to go to the library. Well, it seemed Miss Know-it-all was fully in action. Fortunately, Yvonne was also quite interested in Hogwarts' library collection. The only issue was that, given his current magical strength, most of the books that could truly help him were stored in the restricted section. The restricted section doesn't just contain dark magic, it also holds many works on white magic, advanced alchemy, and potion formulas, all classified as forbidden books. The so-called forbidden books generally refer to magical knowledge that young wizards may not yet understand and could harm themselves with if mishandled. Of course, Yvonne still had Dumbledore. Old Dumbledore had promised him that he could come to him at any time to inquire about magical knowledge after all. Damn. It's truly deserving of being the oldest magical school in the world. The sheer volume of books is astounding. Upon arriving at the library, Yvonne was struck by the magnitude of Hogwarts knowledge reserves. Though Hogwarts might not be ranked highest among the world's eleven magical schools, it undoubtedly holds first place in terms of its foundations. Additionally, Yvonne realized he had been wrong about something. The open books in the library were not as useless as he had initially thought. In fact, they contained countless valuable magical theories. While these books might not provide complete spells, the theories and insights they offered about magic were real treasures. For example, the book Yvonne was currently reading, The Basic Principles of Spells, used nearly 100 pages to describe the various changes the author experienced while casting 100 different spells. The essence of spells is psychological suggestion. All incantations and wand movements serve to reinforce this impression. Yup, Yvonne thought to himself, this aligns with what I had guessed. The next step was refining the details of casting. To cast each spell, you first need a clear goal, what you want to achieve and what effect you intend the spell to produce. This step is fundamental, and Ivan's understanding of it can be summarized as imagination. To bring your intentions to life you must first think and then engage your heart. The heart, representing the soul, embodies your strong desire to achieve your goals. Finally, you solidify everything with firm will to cast a complete spell. This applies to spells like the vanishing spell and the levitation charm. The mind doesn't necessarily enhance the power of these spells but ensures the realization of the wizard's intent. The mind encompasses emotions and desires. A strong will stabilizes magic and makes spell casting more seamless, Yvonne thought and the power of a spell depends on the emotions the wizard channels while casting it. Reading further, Yvonne finally understood the relationship between three of the six attributes mind, thinking, and will and their connection to magic. In simple terms, the mind relates to magical power and efficiency. The higher a wizard's mind attribute, the greater the potential of their magical power. For example, in the case of a spell like the Blasting Curse, its power is related to the caster's magical strength and the emotional state at the time of casting. If a wizard's mind attribute is only a one, then even casting the blasting curse in a state of intense anger might result in nothing more than the destruction of a small house. In the original story, Peter Pettigrew used the blasting curse to destroy an entire street. Based on Ivan's assessment, Pettigrew's mind attribute was likely around a three, with a maximum of four at best. By extension, if a wizard with a mind attribute of five casts a powerful spell, Yvonne believes the results would be beyond imagination. Perhaps a blasting curse could destroy an entire mountain. Consider the end of Fantastic Beasts 2, when Credence's suppressed explosion obliterated a cliff thousands of meters away with a single blast this illustrates the terrifying potential of such straightforward destructive magic. Of course, Credence's explosive magic was a result of pure magical release and had nothing to do with the mind attribute. The influence of the mind attribute works more like a multiplier, amplifying the original magic by geometric proportions. Like the love magic. Mentioned in the original series, Yvonne mused, recalling the love magic Lily Potter released before her death a form of passive resistance spell. This rare and powerful spell was able to counter Voldemort's killing curse. The magic required for a passive resistance spell isn't insignificant it likely requires at least a mind attribute of three or higher. Once that requirement is met, the spell relies heavily on the caster's deep, genuine love. The power of love greatly enhances the passive resistance spell resulting in a qualitative leap where 1 plus 1 is greater than 2. Even Voldemort was unable to touch Harry because of it. In theory, any magic can be infused with the power of the mind, Yvonne realized. 
This was something he had felt while practicing spells, though the process was anything but smooth it was, in fact, extremely challenging. Ivan's mind attribute was only at two points. He struggled to control even that level of mental power, let alone harness it fully in spell casting. Fortunately, even without the enhancement of the mind, magic drawn purely from magical power is still immensely potent. This highlights the importance of raw magical power and powerful spells. After all, no matter how much mind you pour into a simple repulsion spell, it will never surpass the power of a well-cast blasting curse. Chapter 37 Mind and Will the thinking attribute is related to the refinement of magic and its various transformations. In Ivan's view, the best way to showcase this attribute is through transfiguration, as the thinking attribute improves, the things you transfigure become more lifelike. Additionally, extremely complex alchemy and potion making also require wizards to have excellent thinking. The thinking attribute is also closely tied to reaction speed, calculation ability, and memory. Of the three core attributes, thinking offers the best value for its impact. Yvonne concluded, noting that the thinking attribute touches on many areas. The mind attribute, on the other hand, is more of a hidden attribute, as its upper limit is rarely tested. Especially when it comes to learning, the mind attribute isn't as useful. Then there's will. The role of will is also clearly explained in the book it's about safety. Many dangerous magics exist in the wizarding world, with black magic being the most notorious. In this world, the distinction between black magic and white magic lies in the different paths of exploration. Black magic, for instance, delves into the body and soul research that is internal to the wizard while white magic focuses more on changing the external world. Wind, rain, thunder, lightning, time, space, and material structure these are the domains of white magic. In contrast, the curses, jinxes, and hexes of black magic revolve around how to destroy life and how to inflict suffering on a body and soul. Moreover, most black magic requires negative emotions, which is why many dark wizards eventually lose their way. Some might argue that power itself is neither good nor bad, but that it's people who are either good or bad. However, this perspective is not entirely applicable in the world of Harry Potter. Black magic is something that truly distorts both the body and soul. Without a strong enough will, wizards cannot bear the consequences at all. Wizards with strong wills can resist the side effects of black magic, and even become immune to most black magic. This was something Yvonne hadn't expected. So the will attribute is also connected to magical resistance. The attributes of mind and will complement each other. The mind determines the strength of magic, but powerful magic inevitably comes with the risk of being difficult to control and potentially harmful to the caster. At that point, will is crucial to prevent magical loss of control and protect the caster from unintended consequences. A prime example is the animagus transformation. Yvonne is a natural metamorphmagus, but his transformations are limited to human forms he cannot change into animals or other creatures. According to the original books, animagus transformation is extremely dangerous. Any mistake could cause permanent damage. Such damage includes, but is not limited to, turning into a monster, being stuck in animal form, retaining animal characteristics, adopting animal habits, losing human consciousness, and more. If the will is high enough, any magical transformation, even something as complex as bloodline transformation, becomes much safer. Even if a mistake occurs, a strong will can stabilize the magic and prevent external forces from causing harm to the body. So that's how it works. Yvonne thought to himself, the mind channels outward, the will stabilizes internally, and thinking makes the two more refined and precise. Of course, the foundation of all this is still magic. Without magic, no matter how high your attributes are, you won't be able to cast even the simplest Lumos spell. Yvonne. Soul, 5. Magic, 5. Physique, 1. Thinking, 3. Mind, 2. Will, 2. Current potential points, 0. After raising his soul to 5 points, Yvonne began to contemplate his next attribute improvement. Aside from the unknown role of physique, Yvonne had already developed a clear strategy for distributing points among his other attributes. Mind and will need to be synchronized. When mind is high, the upper limit of magical power increases, but without sufficient will to control it, it could end up harming both myself and others. Ivan's thinking had also reached three points. According to his advanced strategy for assigning points, if he gained more potential points, he planned to invest them in thinking. Of course, I could also try adding one point to physique to find out what it's actually useful for. 
After spending the entire morning in the library, Ivan and Hermione went through many books, but Ivan still didn't find any material that discussed the concept of constitution. This left Ivan feeling rather puzzled. Fortunately, Ivan still had Dumbledore. He planned to visit the headmaster's office after tonight's history of magic class to ask for guidance. It was now noon. After lunch, Ivan and Hermione returned to the common room and parted ways there. Yuamai is so cute. Can I take her with me? Hermione asked, her tone full of excitement. Yuamai, who was also quite fond of the little witch, didn't mind at all. So, Ivan let Hermione take care of Yuamai, with the added benefit that she could cuddle with Yuamai while sleeping. What about Crookshanks? Well, when it comes to cats, the more the merrier. Great. I'll take good care of her. Hermione said enthusiastically before hopping away. They had herbology class in the afternoon, which would be their first class since arriving at Hogwarts. Yvonne also needed to head to the dormitory to get ready. H-A-A-A. On the stairs, Yvonne ran into Ronald and Harry, who were both yawning. Morning, Yvonne. Morning. Yvonne smiled and greeted the two of them. But soon, Yvonne overheard the chatter coming from the common room. It's over there, look. Where? Next to the tall red-haired boy. The one with glasses. Did you see his face? Did you see his scar? Yvonne knew this marked the start of the school experience that Harry, the savior, would inevitably face. He patted the overwhelmed Harry on the shoulder. Get used to it. Yvonne wasn't too concerned about Harry's situation. Voldemort, who had possessed Quirrell, was planning to steal the Philosopher's Stone, and Dumbledore was using this as an opportunity to give Harry a trial, cultivating his courage and abilities. As for whether Dumbledore would include Yvonne in the rescue mission, he didn't care much. After all, if Dumbledore taught him valuable magical knowledge, it would only be natural for Yvonne to offer something in return. Others might be worried about Voldemort's potential return, afraid of what that might bring. But in Ivan's eyes, Voldemort wasn't that formidable. Let alone other things, just based on Ivan's current attributes, even if he doesn't improve, he is confident that he will be invincible when Voldemort comes in the fourth year. Peak 5 magic and soul are not for show, Ivan's talent is not inferior to Voldemort at all. Moreover, living in the wizarding world, Ivan will sooner or later confront Voldemort, an unstable factor. In this case, why howled Ivan change the plot? According to the prophecy, let Voldemort die in the hands of Harry and the Gryffindor Swords chosen Neville, isn't it better? Chapter 38 Herbology Class Ha this old bee is really cunning. He made a deal with me early on. Yes, a deal. Dumbledore would do his best to train Yvonne and ensure his safety, while Yvonne would quietly watch the events unfold without interfering. All in all, it would only take four or five years, and Yvonne felt he wasn't losing out on anything. Hey, Neville, what are you looking for? With that thought in mind, Yvonne walked into the dormitory, only to find Neville rummaging through his belongings, searching for something. I Yvonne. The shy boy looked up when he saw Yvonne, and his eyes immediately filled with tears. My Trevor, he's gone again. Yvonne shook his head helplessly, thinking he might need to cast a tracking spell on Trevor. He comforted Neville, assuring him that Trevor knew his way around and would find his way back home. To Ivan's surprise, Neville believed him and actually calmed down after five minutes. No, he probably just forgot about Trevor already, Yvonne thought to himself. By the way, Neville, are you ready for the herbology class this afternoon? There's class this afternoon. Yvonne was at a loss for words. He honestly didn't know what to say to Neville. Because Neville was cursed with a forgetfulness kind of curse as a child, his brain doesn't function very well. He's slow and forgets things in an astonishing way. But Yvonne didn't dislike Neville. Looking at him, Yvonne felt as if he were dealing with a young, clumsy little brother. He felt responsible for taking care of his silly roommate. To prevent any accidents, I'll hold on to the herbology books for you. Yvonne found two books for herbology, cast a shrinking charm on them, and stuffed the now mahjong-sized books into his pockets. You go have lunch first. Harry and Ron are heading there too. Make sure to go to the herbology classroom with them afterward. If he didn't say this, Yvonne had a feeling that Neville would probably forget all about herbology after eating. I... I just have a bad memory, Neville said sheepishly. But I remember that I need to go to class. Should. He added the last word even less confidently. Even Neville seemed to doubt himself, 
as he always forgot such things. Sigh. Yvonne couldn't say anything more. He sighed and gave up the idea of resting in the dormitory. Forget it, I'll take you to the Great Hall. Yvonne said, it's a good chance for me to explore Hogwarts Castle anyway. As they walked through the corridors of Hogwarts, Yvonne noticed the ghosts floating by, greeting the young wizards coming and going. The Weasley twins, in particular, seemed to be having the most fun. You have to admit, the Weasley twins truly are the jokers of Hogwarts, constantly bringing laughter to those around them. Hi, Yvonne. George spotted Yvonne wandering alone and casually threw an arm around his neck in a familiar manner. Where's your girlfriend? Why aren't you with her? Hey, George. Yvonne knew he meant no harm, but he still warned him, just don't say that in front of Hermione. I know, and I'm Fred. Right. Fred, who was on the other side, added, and I'm George. Hey I doubt that. Yvonne grinned mischievously, not correcting them, but instead just staring silently at the twins, making them both a little uneasy. Okay, I admit it, I'm George. George raised his hands in surrender, asking, how did you figure us out? This wasn't the first time they'd played tricks to confuse people about who was who, but it was the first time someone saw through it so easily. Because the magic signature within you is different, Yvonne replied simply, then continued walking toward the courtyard outside the Great Hall, leaving the twins looking puzzled behind him. Afterward, Yvonne explored the entire first floor, including the entrance hall, the viaduct and the towers of Greyfinder and Ravenclaw. Once he felt that enough time had passed, he leisurely made his way to the greenhouses at the edge of the school. Professor Sprout had been waiting for a while, and Yvonne spotted Hermione and Neville arriving with Ron and Harry. Neville, here's your book. Yvonne undid the shrinking spell on the book, restoring it to its original size, and handed it back to Neville. Thank you, thank you. The shy boy clutched the herbology textbook to his chest. Meanwhile, Hermione quickly approached Yvonne excitedly sharing the new knowledge she had gathered from the library that afternoon. By the way, have you memorized the contents of the herbology course? Yvonne didn't know how to respond to Hermione's question, so he chose to ignore it. Are all the students here? Greyfinder's herbology class was combined with Hufflepuffs. Professor Sprout, a plump, middle-aged witch, stood before them. She was a kind and gentle woman, and Yvonne felt she had more of the aura of a friendly country aunt than that of a magical professor. In this herbology class, Professor Sprout introduced various fascinating herbs and explained their uses, along with the importance of learning this subject. Of course, for most students, the main takeaway from herbology could be boiled down to three things, identifying herbs, taking care of herbs, and using herbs. The students from Hufflepuff and Greyfinder had a good relationship, and throughout the class, everyone behaved well following Professor Sprout's instructions as they admired the rare and exotic plants she had cultivated in the greenhouse. Wait, this one. Suddenly, Yvonne noticed a familiar plant. It resembled a cauliflower, with green leaves wrapped around a red, toothy mouth. The sight of it was both strange and unsettling. Yvonne. Hermione noticed Ivan's gaze and asked, Isn't that, biting cabbage? Biting cabbage an important weapon in a Hogwarts game Yvonne had played before his time in this world. It had once sparked the slogan, Don't study dark magic, join Hufflepuff herbology. Ha those days this thing is pretty strong, Yvonne joked to Hermione. Unfortunately, the little witch didn't get the humor at all and instead started carefully observing the biting cabbage. What? Uh, I was just kidding. Yvonne had been using both his psychic vision and magic eye since entering the greenhouse. While he had joked about the biting cabbage being powerful, it was, in truth, just a light-hearted comment. With his psychic vision, Yvonne could sense the state and even the emotions of the plants and magical flora around him. His magic eye was even more impressive, allowing him to observe things down to their very essence. As a result, in Ivan's perception, the biting cabbage had almost no secrets. He could see that it was imbued with various magical enhancements. Unfortunately, Ivan's current understanding of magic was still shallow, and he couldn't fully grasp the significance of those magical traces. Chapter 39 McGonagall is very happy. Ah. At that moment, a student stumbled and knocked over a row of flower pots nearby. The next moment, a series of crackling sounds echoed through the greenhouse. The student's face turned pale as Professor Sprout and a group of young wizards turned around. Woo oh woo oh. Before anyone could react, a piercing scream rang out. Everyone felt dizzy, 
and the glass on the roof of the greenhouse shattered. Suddenly, the young wizards clutched their heads in pain. Be quiet. Seeing this, Yvonne quickly stepped forward and pressed his palm against the source of the deafening noise on the ground before Professor Sprout could even draw her wand. He didn't cast any specific spell, he simply cut off the raging magic. This strange and terrifying sound wave was a type of magic that Yvonne hadn't encountered in any of his books. It wasn't a traditional spell, but rather something engraved within the peculiar plant lying on the ground. Triggered by a mechanism, Yvonne realized, and was able to use his own magic to disrupt the magic within the plant and force it to stop. While it sounded simple, it was incredibly difficult to execute. Most people would never have an eye capable of perceiving the microscopic world and the traces of magic at such a deep level. Oh! The scream of the mandrake stopped abruptly, which made Professor Sprout pause, her hand still holding her wand. The Hufflepuff head of house quickly checked on the student's condition. Seeing that everyone was fine, just a bit dizzy from the noise, she breathed a sigh of relief. Child? You? Sprout noticed Yvonne. It was this student who had stopped the chaos just moments ago. The mandrakes in the Hogwarts greenhouse were still in the early stages of cultivation. Their screams were terrifying and could cause fainting if prolonged, but they weren't lethal. But even so, Sprout didn't want to see her students sent to the hospital wing during their very first class. My name is Yvonne, Yvonne Ambrosius, Professor. Oh, Mr. Ambrosius. Professor Sprout's eyes were filled with admiration and gratitude. Thanks to you, no one got hurt. Greyfinder, 20 points. Hwalala. After her announcement, the students who understood what had just happened applauded Yvonne warmly. Professor Sprout did not scold the student who had caused the disturbance. She gently placed the inexplicably quiet mandrake back into its pot. This is a mandrake. You'll learn about this magical plant in your second year. She explained the habits and dangers of mandrakes to the students and expressed her gratitude to Yvonne once more. Yvonne, how did you do that? Hermione didn't understand at all what Yvonne had done. He merely stretched out his hand and said a word, and the mandrake immediately calmed down. Yvonne didn't hide anything from Hermione, but the magical theory he explained was too advanced for her to fully grasp. In the end, Hermione could only attribute it to Ivan's unique magical talent, which made the little witch quite envious. Professor Sprout and the other first-year students overheard their conversation as well, and Sprout in particular was quite shocked by Ivan's theory of magical nodes. Later that night, after Yvonne and his classmates had attended the History of Magic class a subject notoriously known as the most boring at Hogwarts it seemed that Professor Binns, the ghost lecturer, had taken the boredom of history to new heights. Yvonne had never experienced such a dull class in his life. While Yvonne and the others were struggling through their evening class, Sprout went to find McGonagall. Minerva, she called out. Sprout, the head of Hufflepuff, and McGonagall, the head of Gryffindor, had always shared a good relationship. Pomona. McGonagall looked at Sprout curiously. What's the matter? The new student in your house, Sprout said, sounding a little excited. I've never seen a young wizard with such talent. You're talking about? McGonagall's eyes narrowed thoughtfully. Yvonne. Yes, Yvonne Ambrosius. Professor Sprout was filled with envy. He protected the students in my class, and I gave him twenty points for that. It was astonishing that Yvonne had been able to calm the mandrake with just one word. Additionally, during the lesson, Sprout noticed that Yvonne had a remarkable affinity with plants the flowers and plants in the greenhouse seemed to adore the child. Aha! Upon hearing this, Professor McGonagall's face lit up with joy. The older cat lady spoke with a trace of pride in her voice, that child is a natural-born great wizard. Professor Sprout was puzzled until McGonagall explained Ivan's background. Merlin's beard. Sprout exclaimed, I always thought that was just a legend. Professor Sprout couldn't help but feel McGonagall's incredible luck. She had gone out to guide two freshmen and ended up discovering such extraordinary talents as Yvonne and Hermione. Yes, Hermione had left a strong impression on Sprout as well. No matter what question Sprout asked, Hermione was the first to raise her hand, always providing the correct answer. Ahem. McGonagall coughed lightly, suppressing her pride, you have to understand, Pomona, the sorting hat is very good at finding the right traits in children. Sprout felt as though she had just swallowed a lemon. The last time the sorting hat placed the Weasley twins in Gryffindor, hadn't McGonagall herself grumbled about the hat deliberately targeting her? Luckily, it was Sprout who brought this up, and the head of Hufflepuff House was merely envious. 
If it had been Flitwick, he might have dragged McGonagall to the Sorting Hat to demand an explanation on the spot. After the history of magic class, Yvonne parted ways with Hermione. He asked the little witch to help feed Yuamai, then headed toward the floor where the headmaster's office was located. Sherbet Lemon After saying the password, the gargoyle statue moved aside, allowing Yvonne to ascend the stairs and knock on the door of the headmaster's office. Headmaster The office looked just the same as it had the last time Yvonne visited, though it felt slightly more spacious. Dumbledore was pacing behind his desk, a habit he indulged in every night. He liked to circle his desk alone, lost in thought. How was your first day? Dumbledore didn't project the image of the world's greatest white wizard in front of Yvonne. Instead, he appeared more like a kindly elder, warm and approachable. It was great, Yvonne smiled. Except for the history of magic, you know. Cuthbert Binz's class is a bit. Haha I understand, Dumbledore chuckled. I asked myself the same question when I was a student. Dumbledore then added with a twinkle in his eye, perhaps it's because ghosts don't get a salary. Chapter 40 Levels of Transfiguration The old man and the young wizard exchanged light-hearted words before moving on to the formal teaching. Dumbledore first assessed Ivan's current level of magic and found that Yvonne had already mastered most of the spells from the standard textbook ahead of time, which left him thoroughly impressed. When I was your age, I hadn't learned nearly as much magic as you have, Dumbledore remarked with a sigh, then asked, So, Yvonne, what do you think magic truly is? What is magic? Excluding the idealistic aspects, Ivan's understanding could be summarized in one simple sentence, it's the realization of one's wishes. Yes, a wish come true, Dumbledore agreed, not withholding any of his knowledge. He demonstrated a silent and wandless spell, transforming a candlestick into a lifelike owl. Yvonne activated his magic eye and spiritual vision to carefully observe the owl. He saw the magic aura radiating from it and noticed the traces of magic intricately woven into the creature's body. It was so delicate and complete that it was nearly indistinguishable from a real owl. Amazing, Yvonne muttered. Although he had always known how powerful Dumbledore was, seeing it firsthand still left him in awe of the old wizard's mastery over magic. This was transfiguration magic that required the integration of thought, will, and magical energy. In Ivan's view, transfiguration was a branch of magic with a very low entry point but an incredibly high ceiling. Many types of magic involved some element of transfiguration. This is the limit of transfiguration that I can reach, Dumbledore said, looking at Yvonne. Do you understand what I mean? Well, Yvonne asked, because it's fake after all, right? Yes, Dumbledore smiled and nodded, clearly optimistic about Ivan's understanding. In his approach to Yvonne, Dumbledore adopted a strategy entirely different from how he treated Voldemort, using trust and sincerity. The old man held nothing back and explained openly, the foundation of transfiguration is the alteration of form. Form, as he explained, refers to the appearance but lacks true function or essence. Beyond that lies the transformation of essence, Dumbledore continued. For instance, turning a stone into a clock where, with sustained magic, the clock functions like a real one. At an even higher level of transfiguration, the mind is involved, he added, referring to objects that, once transformed, have their own thoughts. Examples of this include the sorting hat or Weasley's flying car. Take the paintings around us, Dumbledore gestured to the portraits of former headmasters hanging on the surrounding walls, magic portraits that can talk and have self-awareness are also products of transfiguration. Dumbledore explained that the three stages above weren't difficult concepts for someone like Yvonne. The only real difference was how much time Yvonne would need to fully master them. As for what comes after that? Dumbledore paused, giving Yvonne a careful glance. Minerva told me that you can change your appearance. Yes, the book says it's called Metamorphmagus Metamorphosis Ability, a natural magical ability, Yvonne confirmed. Suddenly, Yvonne realized, you mean, metamorphosis is a higher form of transfiguration. Exactly. Before Dumbledore spoke, Yvonne had already understood that the fourth level was different from the previous three levels, when I change my appearance, it's a real transformation. It doesn't require magic to maintain it. This also meant that if Yvonne didn't choose to revert to his original form, he could live his entire life in someone else's appearance. You're very sharp, Yvonne. Dumbledore complimented him. As you've figured out, metamorphosis and animagus transformation both involve complete, lasting changes. Unlike this owl I transformed, which is bound by a time limit, permanent changes don't require ongoing magic. 
In a similar way, when a wizard uses animagus transformation, they can stay in the animal form indefinitely. More than that, Dumbledore gave Professor McGonagall as an example. After she transforms into a cat, catnip has the same effect on her as it does on real cats. Something to note Yvonne chuckled in his mind. From a biological standpoint, the animagus transformation alters a person into a complete animal, even down to the genetic level. Unfortunately, except for animagus, wizards have never been able to master the true meaning of transfiguration. Except. Dumbledore hesitated, and Yvonne immediately guessed what he meant. The Philosopher's Stone. Dumbledore was a bit surprised, not expecting Yvonne to figure it out so quickly. His initial plan was to gradually pique Ivan's curiosity through the lesson, hoping to get him involved in Harry Potter's upcoming adventure. Of course, Dumbledore would never truly involve Yvonne in the dangerous part of the Philosopher's Stone events, as Yvonne was far too advanced for the challenges set up on the third floor. To Yvonne, the traps were no more than child's play. Dumbledore's only hope was that Yvonne could give Harry a bit of support or perhaps keep an eye on him if needed. However, that plan seemed to be falling apart before it even began. Dumbledore continued, the Philosopher's Stone, created by Nicholas Flamel, can turn any material into gold and produce the elixir of life, granting immortality. The Philosopher's Stone, also known as the Fifth Element, represented the pinnacle of alchemy. The ability to turn ordinary stones into gold was a permanent transfiguration at the material level something modern wizards had yet to achieve. As the conversation followed this thread, Dumbledore began teaching Yvonne the fundamentals of magic. These were not just basic lessons but core principles drawn from Dumbledore's own experiences and insights over the years. Yvonne listened intently, even though they were called basics. He understood that this knowledge, coming from one of the greatest wizards of all time, was priceless. Through Dumbledore's explanations, Yvonne deepened his understanding of the principles behind how wizards cast spells, which in turn refined his own abilities. His level of wandless spell casting improved significantly as a result. Yvonne was particularly curious about the boundaries of magic and asked, Professor, is there anything beyond permanent transformation? Hmm. Dumbledore pondered for a moment, not giving an immediate answer. He cautioned Yvonne not to dive too deeply into this, in the wizarding world, there exists a problem that even the greatest wizards cannot overcome the concept of magical transformation. Magical transformation. Yvonne repeated, not entirely grasping what Dumbledore meant. What do you mean by magical transformation? Fox. Dumbledore called over the dozing Phoenix Fox, who landed on the desk singing a sweet song. Thanks for listening. <laughs>